Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Flexo Summit presented by Duponesco. My name is Julian Fernandez. I am the team leader for Color and Flexo for North America. This first session is a time for format, and we will have four speakers answering questions. But before introducing them, let me go through some housekeeping items. All participants are muted by default to avoid background noise. If you would like to ask a question, please use the question tab on the right side of your screen, and we will try to answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded. You will receive an email with a link to the recording. If you are having audio or video issues, please refresh your browser and increase your computer's volume. If you need a dial-in number, click help, then phone dial-in to find the number and the code. So, I'm going to introduce now our four uh, speakers. Uh, the first one is Pallavi Joyapa from Emerald Packaging. She is the Chief Operating Officer of Emerald Packaging, one of the largest flexible packaging manufacturers on the West Coast. Pallavi joined Emerald Packaging in 2005 as a process control engineer and has risen within the company, serving as quality control manager and director of operations before becoming COO. Pallavi, Pallavi earned a bachelor's degree in engineering from Bangalore University and a master's degree in engineering management from the University of Wisconsin Stout. She's also a certified Six Sigma Black Belt. She is responsible for uh, top line strategic initiatives as well as the optimization of the company daily operation. Hi Pallavi, how are you? Hi, uh, thank you for the great introduction. I just realized that I was on mute. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody online. I'm not sure where everybody is. Um, we are excited to be here and look forward to a, a fun discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, I wasn't sure if my introduction went through. That's why I, I waited. <laughs> no, thank so, you. I was on you. mute. Sorry. We are adapting to this new uh, era of um, um, remote and virtual, right, everyone. Okay, our second uh, speaker is Rolando Montserrat, also from Emerald Packaging. He's the director of Prepress at Emerald Packaging uh, from Union City, California, which with a bachelor degree in advertising, focusing in print media, Rolando shifted to print production, starting with Offset, then Roto, and eventually to Flexography. After working in Southern California for a decade, he accepted the Prepress manager role at Emerald Packaging in 2004, transforming Prepress department as a support for the printing operation. He was able to bring practical working practices for the Prepress staff. Between 2015 to 2017, he took the role of printing operation management before becoming the director of Prepress. Hello, Rolando, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I, it, it's a privilege to join um, such experts in this field. So looking forward to a great discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Okay. Um, third, we have Lou Figueroa from Yellowstone Plastics. Lou is the Director of Printing and Graphic Operations at Yellowstone Plastics. Over 44 years in the wide well flexible packaging industry with a focus on printing and converting of snacks, food, pharmaceutical, fresh produce, and outdoor bags. Actively judging FTA awards for the Flexography Technical Association, also a printing consultant from the flexible packaging industry, operating and installed prepress and converted equipment all over the country. Lou, how are you? Uh, good morning, Julian. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be on this team and uh, get to talk about what's going on in our industry today. Thank you. Thank you for, for um, being with us. Okay. We also have Dan Williamson from Armcore Flexible. 
He's the engineering plan coordinator at Anchor uh, from uh, Yuba City in California. 25 years in the print industry, spanning newsprint, commercial, folding carton, corrugated, and flexible packaging. Primary focus on pre press, press, and overall quality for reproduction processes. How are you, Dan? Thank you for joining us today. Doing good. Thank you. Thanks for having me uh, aboard today. Looking forward to a good discussion and, uh, you know, getting to meet everybody on the team. It's great. It's Thanks. It's a pleasure to have all of you guys in this new era of the virtual, right? Um, so, well, this is a town hall, and uh, the uh, the reason for having this is to hear from you, the experts, the people working in the industry. And I'm just going to be asking questions, and feel free, um, starting um, um, as I introduced you before. Uh, the first question we have here is, how is your company adapting to the new reality and way of doing business? Who wants to, to go first? Yeah, I, I can sort of start. Um, you know, um, we're Emerald Packaging. We're predominantly in the produce packaging space um, here in the Bay Area, California. So as soon as COVID hit, uh, for us, uh, we really had two primary uh, primary goals, and one was human safety. We had to make sure that we kept our employees safe. And the other thing that quickly became very uh, important for us was product safety. Uh, consumers were not comfortable grabbing a, ba a, a produce that wasn't packaged. So we literally overnight saw a huge uptick in sales, um, um, uh, uh, you know, because consumers truly were nervous about food safety. So one of the challenges was, was trying to scale up to meet that demand. Um, so we quickly had to adopt systems in place and trying to make sure that um, uh, employees coming in were safe. We were part of the essential food uh, industry and part of the supply chain. So we had to make sure that we were fully geared and ready for what, we, what was, was, was coming at us. So really the new reality for us is, uh, is as it stands today, is a number one um, uh, employee safety and number two package safety as it relates to uh, the pandemic. So, so yeah, that's, those are some of the changes that we've, we've been seeing uh, of late. Excellent, thank you very much. This uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that we are all in the same boat uh, with this, right? Right. Um, uh, Rolando, do you want to add something to? Yeah, I just, I just want to add that, you know, um, I, I think for us, especially me as an employee of the company, um, the, of course, safety w was the biggest key, but um, from my point of view, it's how um, uh, the leadership reacted um, to, um, to the situation. The, the, the fact that the day COVID was declared a pandemic, uh, the way the leadership reacted um, was so fast that by the following day, we have people uh, working offsite. Uh, practically the entire uh, office was working offsite the following day. Um, they were aware of um, the uh, impact, um, not just in, in, in our company, in our industry um so they have started communicated communication right away with our customers and vendors uh, because they realized that for us to survive uh the situation you know it's our customers that needs to be first drive continue to drive so um that communication uh, was a big factor and that you know very early reaction to it. Excellent. Excellent. Dan, do you want to, would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> sure thing. I mean, I echo some of the same statements. Um, first and foremost, you know, our prim priority was to make sure that our employees were safe. So like, you know, like the guys from Emerald said, we made sure to take non-essential, we'll call type roles, accounting, um, customer service, things of that nature, and move them offsite, you know, 
you know, as quick as we could. That way we can maintain safe distance from everybody. Um, more so, you know, talking with our customers, you know, we're very active role with our customers when it comes to things such as press checks or color approvals, things like that we had to almost internalize. Um, we had to, you know, become become more of a partner to our customer and make sure that, you know, I was, I was personally doing a lot of press checks um, on behalf of a lot of our designers and clients. I think that's, um, can you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay, I think I'll yeah. be able to lose him then. For you know, I, I just want to say, Julian, that for uh, for us folks in manufacturing, suddenly taking on an off-site model overnight is not easy. So trying to mobilize everybody to work off-site and, and um, as far as the customer is concerned, um, in their eyes, um, you know, it has to be seamless. So just this challenge is associated with moving people off-site and um, trying to get peop uh, suppliers and vendors and and um, all of our uh, supply chain geared up to the fact that hey we're an essential business was um, was uh, quite quite a feat at that time to overcome and um, um, and so far it's been it's been um, uh, you know all put together and we're in we're in a good spot. Um, one thing I have seen uh, in the last um, six months, which has is interesting, is that most of the factory acceptance uh, tests, when it comes to machinery, are all virtual. I thought, you know, in in the in the flexible packaging space, um, that's uncommon. You always had you always had your technicians fly in and do virtual uh, do actual factory acceptance uh, tests, right? Perform them on site. So it's all been virtual now. So it's that's an interesting shift. And do you think that that is something that will stay after that is coming to stay? That that is that is a lot of saving in time and uh, uh, press approvals, right? Absolutely. I think press approvals have become virtual. Um, I think it may end up staying, um, you know, as long as travel is limited and travel becomes uh, uh, less and less, it, it could end up staying. Yeah, we have conducted press checks with um, actual cameras and even self using cell phones, which was a no no uh, in the norm, but um, we have to adopt. Uh, the situation and so we have to find whatever solution there is out there uh, and did you find that that is uh, a faster way to approve jobs or it ends up um, taking more time and having customers disappointed um it, it's actually uh at the moment sort of more on the positive side um of course you know the, the color we cannot really represent it through a picture but um, we can focus on um, the on the print and actually show them the actual print quality. Um, and uh, by using the spectrophotometer, we can at least uh, give them some numbers to to look at to to prove that we we are a color. But um, yes, it does take time. Uh, it takes longer. Um, you have to have um, all the uh, elements uh, right in your hands, right there in the conference room. And that's kind of difficult because mo most of the, the equipment are out there by the press area. So, you know, we just have to improvise. Dan, are you back with us? Yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Uh, we, we didn't finish uh, hearing the the uh, your answer so feel free to go ahead and uh, finish sure um well kind of like the other folks have said we've done a lot of the same things where you know virtual press checks um have been kind of the new norm you know where we can't have clients come in you know it's not physically physically able to, for them to get here or you know because of travel restrictions so using cell phones and other technologies you know we've had to really adapt um, we've even gone as far as overnighting samples, you know, and waiting for that type of approval before we move on to, say, lamination or slitting. 
So, you know, we, we've had to become more flexible as well. Excellent. Lou, what about you? Yeah, much of the same. I mean, we're doing all of our uh, customer approvals virtual, and we have all the camera systems in here to be able to do that with digital video management. And, uh, you know, we've also done some uh, press trials in Europe the same way. And uh, it's really worked out well. It's really taught a lot of us how to adapt in this situation and make more with less. And, you know, this pandemic has caused um, absenteeism of people with family issues and uh, high customer demands for more products, splitting orders to get more product out, uh, rushing in and adding more equipment. Uh, it's, it's been pretty wild. So that's all I have to say about that. Sanitation, of course, you know, that's that's religious. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two I have here. Uh, what recent technological innovations have been most important in improving the quality of flexographic pr printing? Who wants to start with this one? I'll talk. Lou, do you want to continue? So, yeah. So, you know, I think one of the biggest things was the, you know, uh, the development of uh, servo-driven gearless flexographic printing presses that run higher speeds with tighter registration and better drying systems. That's really contributed a lot to our industry, uh, being able to manipulate the equipment for much faster changeover. Uh, it's just, you know, where we're going with this industry anymore, if we're going to survive in this industry, uh, setups have to be reduced down to nothing. And the equipment that we have in the digital uh, photography that we can uh, read color with inline color spectral photometers and 100% web inspection and automatic register and impression controls, the things that we have today that we didn't have no more than less than 10 years ago. It's just amazing technology. And, and even in pre-press and mounting, everything is so much faster. Um, the uh, implementation of the of the digital flat top screened uh, dots that carry up a lot better print fidelity, much higher print contrast. Our gray balances are so much better. We can extend the gamut if we want and be up online in one to two pull throughs and greatly reduce our make ready times. And, uh, you know, the, the print quality is so close to Rotor beer now. Uh, it's just unbelievable what we can manipulate with that stuff. So. And you probably seen that also from when you judge awards from the FTA, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's getting very competitive out there. Uh, you would be surprised, you know, we go through thousands of samples and um, you get samples on the table and there's there's huge arguments over who's going to get kicked off the table and get awards because they all look so beautiful. You really have to look hard to find something wrong with them. And <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just very, very difficult. And um, I have my own opinion about some of that stuff. But, uh, you know, all I can tell you from a technical standpoint of view, the, the window's a lot tighter between converters as as it was say 10 years ago it's it's a big difference because of the availability of better pre-press and better equipment being able to make your plates in-house and do your your own color separating and manipulating everything the way we can and it's just uh it's really awesome excellent Dan. Yeah. yeah can you hear me still yes yes yeah. perfect yeah, I think the like kind of like uh, Lou said, the biggest thing for us has been, you know, just the plethora of screening that has come out over the last, you know, even just five years to eight years um, and being able to choose the right screening for your type of printing that you're doing. You know, traditionally, you know, you use a lot of three by three cells and different things like that. And now with the advent of like DuPont's Easy Bright screening, you know, you can lay down a beautiful solid even with, you know, water based inks like we use here. Um, out in California in our plant, um, you know, and still be able to save ink. Um, Advent and, you know, analogs technology has improved the quality of printing a lot, you know, using um, eFlow or elongated cell 
technology for for large solids, you know, to lay down smooth without having to do double hits, things of that nature. Um, and also just flat top in the plate, you know, not having to use uh, different other systems that, you know, either you're, you're running the oxygen out of the plate or running your exposures to create a pseudo flat top. Now you have a true flat top photopolymer in the plate that just, you could just put any screening down that of your choosing that's gonna work for you and give you that best quality print you're looking for. I agree, Chris. Uh, what about you, Pallavi? Or, uh, Rolando, you want to take this for me? Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would have to agree with Lou and, and Dan. In the last decade, there's so much uh, technology uh, that's driven uh, flexography. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're a big witness to this, and we have um, uh, thrown ourselves as beta sites. Uh, for even the uh, 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 easy bright screening, uh, we have uh, uh, done it for both conventional and even digital printing. Um, the the plate screening yeah, that that is uh, uh, the biggest game changer for flexography in the last fifteen years. Um, not only did it uh, help uh, us to improve our uh, print quality. But uh, now we know we can expand the gamut at 200 line screen at actual production environment. So, and we even know now that um, we can even increase that um, print resolution if, if we need to. Um, but to me, there's also other real things that um, have improved the, the printing quality, for example, um, we now have composite and both organic pigments um, that's out there that makes printing uh, a lot cleaner, uh, provides uh, longevity on, on the tooling, like uh, filters for the ink pump, the doctor blades, even the analogs. Um, to us, um, because of the market seg segment that we service, you know, white is really a big thing. Um, so with the, this new pigment, uh, pigments that's now available, um, and, um, uh, the, the plating screen tecton technology, we have improved our, uh, the quality of our white, uh, that also adds, uh, in, in increasing our press speed. Uh, we've now have standard for different, uh, opacity for for different um, market segment and so we're we're able to um, uh, provide um, certain uh, expectation especially if jobs are running on the older presses it helps uh, efficiency there uh, if uh, now that we have standards that uh, the operators can target they're not just guessing and second guessing anymore um, that is a big, a big uh, factor to us as far as gaining uh, efficiency. Um, aside from um, having, uh, like Luke pointed out, several uh, given presses uh, with um, carbon fiber mandrels, that that is very um, uh, helpful to, uh, for us. Our market segment have always been producing designs that are not really conducive for or friendly for Plexo. So uh, with those type of technology, um, we gain a lot of confidence um, in our printing process and therefore increase our efficiency. Yeah, yeah. one thing I do want to add, um, Julian, is that um, we were the first beta site for digital printing um, when digital printing became um, a buzzword in the flexible packaging space. And digital printing has been around for many years in the label space, but um, really has become prominent in the flexible packaging space within the last five to six years. So, um, and we were the first beta sites for the HP press here in, in California. And uh, what we've learned out of that experience, frankly, is that flexible packaging or flexible printing has gotten so close to Revere when it comes to quality, has gotten so close to digital when it comes to quality, 
that um, you know, and that's all of that related back to the screening technology that uh, uh, Lou Rolando and Dan talk about. Fast, you know, really robust drying systems on the press. Um, uh, accurate um, uh, uh, mounting systems that have more, that that have taken the human interaction out and have automatically mounted plates. So all of the technology that currently exists has definitely helped bridge that gap between flexible uh, spectrographic printing and roto or digital. And you know it only gets better each passing year, frankly. And you know, there's going to be a time when um, the, the similarities between all of this printing is going to be like, hey, I, I can't tell the difference. It's gotten that good. So um, so it's it's definitely an exciting time to be to be in this industry. I I just going to add that I totally agree with all of you. Every year we think that there's nothing else more to add in terms of quality and then something else happened and uh, we see an improvement, right? And it's surprising. It's, uh, yeah. it's a beautiful time to be in the packaging industry. Yeah. Okay, so let's jump to the other question we have here is, what recent technological innovations have been the most important in improving the efficiency in this time? So before we talk about quality, now I think this is uh, efficiency. Many of the ans of the ones that you answer also help with the efficiency, right? But maybe you want to give another example. I mean, for us, uh, we're in the um, salad packaging space, and if you look at a typical salad bag, it has these really big, large bounce panels. You know, like big panels, right, in the top and the bottom of the of the bag. And these designs sort of um, render themselves to a lot of uh, bounds on the press, right? It's just it's just by design they, they tend to you know make uh, the jobs bounce. So on a on a, any typical uh, day, it's it's rare to run these uh, jobs at say 800 or 900 feet a minute. You really can get there because of the fact that there's too much bounce in the design. Um, one, one new addition to the um, flexographic printing space has been, like Rolando and Lou mentioned, carbon fiber mandrels. They've been just a phenomenal uh, uh, innovation in this space to a point where they're eliminating bounds to a very large degree. And we're now able to pick up speeds. We're now able to get another 15 to 20% throughput out of these designs which used to be unheard of before. So stuff, I mean, stuff like that, you know, better designs when it comes to um, mandrels and, and sleeve technology, using carbon fiber mandrels, softer sticky back and tape that can absorb the bounce a lot better. So we found these innovations to, um, you know, has helped quite a bit to increase throughput for us. Rolando? Thanks. Yeah. Rolando, you want to continue with that? Yes, as I pointed out earlier, um, that um, uh, carbon uh, fiber mandrels alone has um, has provided us more confidence in our uh, in the way we print uh, in our methods and practices, uh, and has helped uh, gain efficiency. Um, you know. Uh, we also have um, employed um, or purchased um, a print needs um, and have qu uh, qualified um, only two uh, print uh, plate material. Uh, so that way we can create um, uh, an, an actual working standard rather than mostly theoretical. Um, we by combining all of these uh, uh, materials, um, we we were able to um, go into jobs whether uh, two weeks from now or, or two years from now exactly the same way, uh, and and that reduces our our, our uh, even from mounting um, where we have uh, information stored already. It's it's very easy to uh, get uh, jobs to press. 
standardization of, of the process in general, right? Correct. Lou, Dan, Lou, do you want to continue? Yeah, the optimization, as Rolando talks about, you know, of, uh, of the curve, it's trying to standardize curves with all the presses instead of having to do it on independent presses is, is really going to be where the future goes with flexography. We're going to have to find ways to optimize to where it takes less time and less work to manufacture a repeatable product every time. And with the pre-press that we have available to us today and the color separating is so much better, uh, there's a lot to manipulate in that area. And uh, because we have better equipment for cleaning our analogs rollers and measuring our analogs roller tolerances to ensure that what we say we're going to do, we have exactly the same repeatable equipment to do it with, whereas uh, the volume of the analogs roller and line screen uh, has to be factored in for what we originally approved. It's very important to have the necessary equipment to consistently have it monitored and cleaned and certified to do the work the way it's supposed to be done. A lot of people think, well, the curves are different on every press. There are, they are different. A lot of it is in the way the doctor blade releases the ink onto the plates. Uh, or, you know, some machines are not as robust as others, it creates problems. But with the screening technology in AMP Flexo that we have today, uh, it takes a lot less impression uh, to set color and to repeat it. And because we're able to build more spot colors out of process, and the gray balance is just so good, it, it just, it's really, it's really harder to mess these jobs up than it is to run them right. It's just really becoming more simplified in our process. So that's what I have to say about that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Just to ask you quickly, uh, how often? It's a, it's a question coming from the from the audience. I would like you uh, you to answer this. How often do you fingerprint your presses, and how often uh, would you check your analog analog condition? Um, I, I have an analox department and all my rollers are, are scanned and um, they're read and they're cataloged and uh, we have a laser that we clean the rollers with and they're constantly sent out if they need it. We don't mess around with stuff like that. They're logged in as they're used. I have backup rollers for everything that I print so I'm not stuck leaving them in the press. If they're in there too long, we take them out for periodical cleanups. If I got an order that's, you know, 20 million feet and I have, I get lucky enough to run it and not have to pull in and out of it, I'm going to pull out of it after about a week and I'm going to clean those rolls. But uh, for the most part, with the short orders that we get today in this business, our, our customer service is forced to break up orders into several orders because uh, we have too many customers to meet those demands we're in and out and we're cleaning and we're monitoring those roles because you know if you okay a job with a customer and uh, you lock in on your labs and your uh, densities and your dot cane and then you use a different roller with a different volume or it's got wear on it or it's plugged and it's not transferring the ink the same you're going to have downtime in your make ready because you're not going to be able to get process color up so uh, a lot of people you know, have learned over the years that oh, the LABs are more important than just the densities. They are, but you still need to lock in on what you started with and repeat it every time. So that's more important than anything else. Excellent. Uh, Dan, do you want to you add your piece of this? Yeah, <clears throat> sure thing. Um, when it comes, when I think about efficiency, I think of like total, you know, press uptime. You know, you have a lot of different components to printing when it comes to the plates, the analogs, as you know, Lou talked about, inks and everything's of that nature. Um, one of the biggest things for efficiency for us here has been converting over to thermal plate processing. So, you know, you're reducing your 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 time of, you know, three hours, say, to make a, you know, a plate down to, you know, 45 minutes, you know, and you're getting, you know, same or sometimes better quality depending on what screening you're using before, and you're able to get those plates to press faster. Um, you know, God forbid you have a plate damaged on press, you know, you're able to get it fixed and back on without having to pull the job, order plates, or wait several hours for those to come back. 
um, that's been a real key to, to our total print uptime is the thermal processing. Um, along with that, I know um, the others have mentioned about the uh, mounting systems. We've invested here as well in a, like AV Plexa semi, you know, SAM mounters that use camera registration systems um, that takes the human factor out of it, so to speak, when it comes to registering, you know, upwards of 10 color jobs. Um, that's led to a lot more efficiency, you not having to pull jobs off to make micro adjustments of certain colors, you know, to get them back and register because of older system. Um, Either analog cleaning, as Lou stated, has been a big key for us as well. Um, not having to clean analogs, you know, when you have really tough to clean water-based inks, you have to clean analogs two, three times, especially with whites. Sometimes to get them fully clean and get them back to that full volume. The laser analogs, you're, you know, 30 minutes, you can have a, you know, 67-inch roll ran through and you're back to full volume, ready to go back on press, and it's measurable. And you can make sure you're there, so. I think having a lot of the inputs and components around those systems, um, even with inks, you know, as uh, Rolando mentioned, different pigments. I mean, we have the water base, we have different surfactant packages we can change that alter the resolubility of the ink, uh, make it easier on the analox rolls. We can combat the heat in the California summer because we're not climate controlled, um, things of that nature. That just, all those, all those components really lend to the efficiency and keeping our total press uptime, you know, and everything running in the press room efficiently. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to continue with the next question, which is, what do you think will be the most important changes to the packaging and printing industries over the next 10 years? I think sustainability will have to play a big role. Um, I think this is the future of our industry. And so um, th this is something that we really need to um, uh, be focused on. I mean, um, there are already some solutions out there, but unfortunately, because it's not um, commercially uh, acceptable at this time, it, you know, the, the cost is way high, but uh, I think there, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement there. And I think, um, uh, all of us should band together and focus on that. Excellent. Yeah, sustainability and the environment. Palavi, I know that you, this is one of your areas of expertise, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, COVID sort of took the focus away from sustainability. Um, because people were suddenly started looking at food safety being an issue. But the fact of the matter is that um, it's only, it, it's uh, sustainability is going to become um, ready for prime time and it has to become ready for prime time right now. So, right, we don't have much time. Um, there's a ton of legislative changes um, being uh, mandated. Legislation has gotten more and more stringent around this. Um, uh, everybody uh, is expecting us to give them a recyclable, a recycled, a compostable, a biodegradable. We want everything. But the fact of the matter is that um, we, we aren't anywhere where we, we say we are, right? Stuff that they claim uh, is being recycled is really not being recycled because we really don't have a curbside infrastructure that would properly collect and sort recyclable material. This will end up in landfill. So they're not truly really being recycled. Um, there are fake claims being made around compostability and availability. And, um, uh, and, and there is this legislation that says everything needs to change in the next five to 10 years. And the fact of the matter is it's impossible to do so, right? I mean, we need time to do to put through systems uh, when it comes to recycling in place. Um, uh, there, you know, um, we truly don't have sorting facilities that can sort flexible packaging today. It's going to require a huge investment to be made in recycling infrastructures to be able to recycle polyethylene, for example. So, um, so, so definitely the challenge that our industry is 
seeing now and will continue to see unless real focus and effort is put into this is, is sustainability. And I think there's also a very, um, there's also a very, um, um, you know, sustainability isn't just about films. Sustainability is about responsible machinery. It's about responsible adhesives. It's about responsible coatings. It's about, it's about every single critical aspect of the supply chain, right? How do you design sustainability into your product? How do you design a responsible product? And that's what everybody needs to start thinking, right? It's just, I mean, for example, a, a brand uh, um, um, needs to say, hey, I want a sustainable uh, uh, graphic design, for example, right? It must, must have um, a certain amount of coverage. Maybe 100% coverage on a design is not a sustainable solution because the inks may not compose or you know it, it's not compostable or they don't biodegrade so brands have to say okay i'm i i need to now um design a bag that is a responsible bag so there's more to sustainability just with film you have to look at graphics you've got to look at coatings you have to look at adhesives you've got to look at films and you also have to look at machinery you know how can i build a machine that uses less heat, less temperature, less pressure, and less resources to, you know, run fast and can run at, without, you know, using too much natural resources. So I, I think it, it's it's a more of a holistic approach needs to be taken that doesn't quite exist today. And frankly, the day of reckoning is is here for all of us within the industry to do something about it. Sorry, that ended up being long. Uh, no, long. thank you very much. That was um, that was exactly a good perspective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lou, do you want to do you want to add your comments? Well, I mean, with sustainability the way it is today, uh, you know, we we continue to invest in faster and lower waste solutions, and labor rates and incentive for workers rise, and uh, you know, managing. Uh, cost variances and force majeure all the things that are going on right now you really have to optimize your processes from top to bottom because you know sometimes the customers don't want to pay the up charges and it becomes very competitive a lot of us can have to compete with each other to print some of the same products and um, you know it's getting to the point where they want something for nothing you really have to shave your costs you're constantly looking for ways to shave your cost. You're scrapping your cost. The automation of, of uh, printing equipment today, they have equipment that can can be in, in register set, fire the press up, and that was never achievable before. Those kind of things, that's what you're going to see in the future. You're just A lot of this stuff is going to go away. It's going to be very tough for the small converters that don't have the money to invest in the automation. There, we have our own robotics division up in Canada, and we're constantly looking at ways to automate where we need less labor to manufacture bags and various other things that we do. And, and the thing of it is, uh, you know, labor is it's a huge hurt for us in this industry. Finding people that want to learn the business, the millennials, um, they like it all up front. And um, if, if it's too, it get, becomes too technical, and sometimes, you know, it's hard to keep them interested because they want to move up the ladder very fast. And so, you know, all of these things are contributing factors to sustaining your product. And you know, meeting the demands of the plastic. We're looking at paper. I mean, there, there's all kinds of things that we have to do to change as things go. It's never going to stop. So what I'm hearing uh, in other words is that everyone so far is focused on efficiency, right? Yeah. Um, and sustainable efficiency. That would be the, um, what we see for the next 10 years is what we are focusing on today. Excellent. So um, uh, Dan, do you wanna make a comment? <clears throat> yeah, sure thing. Um, another thing in the, that I see that's gonna be really important coming up is our consumables. You know, how do we consume things? How much do we consume? 
you know, in the next 10 years. You know, we look at things such as sticky bags. Someone had asked a question over in the uh, questions, really great question about reusing sticky bag. You know, that's something that we do here. You know, if we have a short run, we'll reuse that sticky bag two, three times. You know, so we're not generating we're not generating that waste. Um, there's the Tessa twin lock system out there that has, you know, the, the embedded sticky bag. We've done some trials with that and may move more towards that. Um, you know, DuPont, they make some really good plates and they're even working on making plates that are more robust so you can use them longer and use them over and over and over. So you just, you're, everything you could do to reduce that consumable waste, you know, what you buy. Um, looking at the adhesives that we lose on our lamination, a lot of times that could be the big thing and, you know, that limits or prohibits recyclability. You know, trying to get a better adhesive that's more recyclable or friendly. Um, things of that nature. I think that's going to be the biggest thing to look at is how much do you use and why? And is there any way you can reuse it, repurpose it, or just use less overall, but still meet the client's needs and the industry needs? Excellent. So then I'm going to move to the next question. And since you were answering this one, I would like you to answer the next one. How has the need for sustainability changed your business in the recent years? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's actually changed it quite a bit. Um, being once again in California, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, we're, we're, we're limited on air credits. As I know the guys are at Emerald will understand that. You're limited on solvent usage, things of that nature. Um, this Amcor location, you know, we've recently switched over to thermal plate processing. So that's, you know, got rid of the solvents in the plate room and the solvent recycling and the sludge and that waste stream. Um, on our analogs cleaning, we've gone to laser analogs cleaning. So that's gotten rid of, you know, the harsh chemicals that we used to use to bust down our inks. Once again, our inks, we use water-based inks. So we're not using solvents. Um, you know, everything we, our inks are basically designed to dissolve and be disposed of, you know, as non has waste um, down the road. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things that we've done. Um, and a lot of them can be challenges. Um, you got the film manufacturers in terms of sustain sustainability. Um, you know, we've called on them to make, you know, we've tried recyclable plastic, you know, in films and primaries or ones that are made from recycled materials. A lot of times they're hard to hard to print on. You know, they take they take a lot to get print on, but um, you know, it's it's all things that moving forward that we all have to think about in our day to day, for sure. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Dan, to uh, pick back on what you said, we're all living off of light credits more than just air credits right now, frankly. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been challenging to say the least, but the fact of the matter is that we're in California. California sort of drives legislation, just not for the state, but also for all of the U.S. So um, we've, Emerald, we have created our own portfolio of uh, sustainable products. We've also introduced a lot of sustainable practices and methods within our uh, manufacturing facility. You know, we, we're also a very green business certified um, a company, which basically means that we recycle everything from chip boats to pallets to to um, rubber to um, whatever you can think of. All manufacturing supplies within the facility gets recycled. So, so we sort of have taken a two-fold approach to sustainability. One is putting together a sustainable practice and sustainable business method, which handles all. Um, all of our consumables and recycles that. And then there's the uh, sustainable um, or portfolio that we have produced that looks at biodegradable materials, composable materials, downsizing or right sizing of products. How do you go about um, uh, reducing the grade? How do you go about reducing costs associated with transportation? How do you bring your overall carbon footprint down? So we sort of looked at that aspect of sustainability as well. And uh, Kevin, who is our CEO, is extremely involved with the legislation, especially around SB 54, that basically bans plastics 10 years from now. So there's much work that needs to be done between now and the next 10 years 
um, in terms of uh, educating consumers, educating brands, educating educating people that you know uh, uh, carbon uh, the carbon footprint when it comes to plastics is much lesser than that of paper, and that you're you're not killing off trees, and that um, and that plastic really does extend the shelf life of a product. And um, uh, food waste, when you look at it, actually is a bigger issue. It, it puts out m methane, which is more toxic than carbon dioxide. So those things, I, mean, I think education um, and the lack of knowledge amongst our consumers today is, is a big challenge for the industry. And it's a big ch and that we all collectively have to uh, work on in, when it comes to uh, increasing the awareness level and educating the consumer base and going out there and um, and basically talking about flexible packaging and the importance to um, to the environment and how we can how we can collectively uh, work towards it fantastic um, I think Lou do you want to add something to uh, Pavali or Rolando, feel free to. Well, I just think that we have to educate our customers that uh, this is a joint effort in making these biodegradable products because, you know, it's always put on the converters all the time to generate uh, different type of films that are more degradable and then they don't make them very affordable and uh, they don't print as good. It's, there's a lot of technology there uh that we have to deal with but i think if we could educate our customers and they would help us out more uh we could partner up and make a lot of headway i really think the day will come when you won't see solvent based uh printing inks because of carcinogens in the inks i really think you're going to see more of a biodegradable ink system uh being formed that we'll have to adapt to as well and uh you know there's a few people in our industry that really pushed themselves, Kevin being one of them, that's always lobbying to get people more educated up in Sacramento to understand about all this environmental stuff and recycling and, and all the extended costs that the converter has to pay that, that the consumer is not paying for in the price of the packaging. And these things need to be leveled out because packaging is not going to go away. We have to package our food. And even though paper might be a solution for some of it, It'll create other problems down the road. We still got to work together and partner up to fix this. And it's for the industry, not selfishly for ourselves. Absolutely. I think extended producer responsibility begins, um, you know, begins from the resin manufacturers to the uh, uh, producers, to the uh, retailers and the brands. Um, and and that's the only way we can improve the recycling infrastructure because it requires a ton of money, and it's it's and and that can only come from EPR related initiatives. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. Do you want to add something to to this question, or we should move to the next one? I just, I just um, want to um, point out what Pallavi said. One of the uh, things that Pallavi pointed out was that, you know, um, awareness. Awareness is uh, really, uh, public awareness is what we need right now. I think there should be um, uh, not just the, uh, the end users or the consumers need to be aware of it, but one of the biggest hindrance right now for sustainability to become a reality is because there's a lot, uh, the public is not completely aware of um, what it takes to, to get there and, and um, the current effects of not being there. So um, I think awareness is, is the key. I agree. Okay, so we are running out of time now. It's six minutes uh, to the hour. I'm going to move to the last question and um, and let's see what it is. What are the key pain points for your industry and how have they evolved over time? Rolando, do you want to start with this one? I think we've, we've um, 
uh, pointed out some of these early on. Um, uh, right now, we're we're trying to evolve uh, uh, because of this uh, situation. We're, we're still in the learning curve, trying to adopt new ways, uh, finding new solutions. So um, there's always this experimentation um, that that we have to go through, and it, it kind of slows us down. Um, uh, we have to really plan um, before we jump in the water, um, and and at times we just just have to um, go at it and see what happens. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, uh, uncertain uh, uh, steps that we are taking right now, um, and um, uh, not necessarily crossing our fingers, but uh, we're we're somewhat into that point where um, we have to uh, commit to um, a certain uh, action and without really knowing um, how effective the results will be. And um, uh, even here in Prepress, not just you know, uh, uh, in other departments, but uh, here in Prepress, where we adopted several um, procedures in, in the last two months alone, um, just trying to um, uh, figure out a way to uh, continuously um, cope with the demands from our customer base. Um, and so we're, uh, we have, we're reviving old um, uh, processes or practices that we have uh, set aside a long time ago and we're developing new ones. So um, right now it's it's one of the, uh, at least in my department, one of the, the biggest um, challenge that we're dealing with. Thank you. That's a pre-press uh, vision, right? Um, Dan, do you wanna, do you wanna answer this last question? Yeah. Sure thing. I mean, when I think about like, you know, the, the key pain points of the industry, um, it's definitely involved over the years. You know, before we used to think about, you know, getting, you know, getting primary films that had too much oil on them or had the wrong, you know, treat level on them and dealing with kind of some functional issues, um, getting plate material that comes in green and we got to wait for it or, you know, had different height, you know, thickness variation. A lot of those issues have been resolved and they seem kind of trivial. And now it's you got to think about the other the other guys your your suppliers your vendors your customers and what they have going on on their end and now having to work with them kind of like rolanda said you know having to work with them and make sure that they have your supplies in their supply chain and you can get them at the appropriate time so you can meet your clients needs you know and having that good partnership having good forecasts having you know sometimes ordering double triple what you need just so you can have it um because right now things you know as we all know we're very hand to mouth when it comes to not only supplies but people everything's in demand so being really flexible no pun intended um is is really key right now and making sure that you know you plan 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 and do the best you can for everybody thank you very much dan um, Luz, sorry, do you want to continue with the answer? Well, labor is a key pain point for us, and uh, obviously uh, there are many factors, you know, uh, reduction, uh, waste solution reductions, uh, managing costs, this freight rises, film, everything else, trying to manufacture your own films, and just basically becoming self-sufficient in everything that we do and then going back and finding out how we can reduce less. I really think that our process printing, because it's become so much better than what it used to be and being able to produce expanded gamut with little effort, I really think you're gonna see a lot more of that in our industry because it uses less ink. So if you're laying down less coating weight of ink, you're, you're actually producing less scrap because your pounds per ream of ink that you're laying down is far less. It, it allows the inks to dry faster and trap better at high speeds. 
getting product out quicker. And I really think the day will, will be where we'll all be doing expanded gamut, and that's all you're going to see in the press. And we're just not going to be able to accommodate what we did 20 years ago. A lot of that stuff is going to go away. We're going to have to find a cheaper way to manufacture. Everybody wants everything just in time. Uh, we're pushing our suppliers to warehouse products nearby so that we don't have to over purchase and keep a lot of inventories and try to move everything that's finished out as fast as we can produce it. So that's all I have to say on that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mark Sanford is going to be super happy with your answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, did you want to uh, say something else? Well, I, I, I agree with all of uh, uh, what Dan and Lou and Rolando are saying. Um, the one the one issue, though, we continue to struggle with, however, is is um, uh, recruiting and finding skilled labor. It's been tough. Uh, I think that's definitely a huge uh, pain point for us. Um, finding journeyman, pressmen, and um, uh, having um, a, a pouch operator know how to set the machine up. I mean, just look, finding skilled labor has been a huge challenge for us. So I, I, if the industry could do more uh, when it comes to um, training and education, that would, that would definitely be something that uh, would benefit all of us. So I think um, that's lacking today. Yeah, if I could expand on that, Paul, I, you know, one of the things that I was thinking that comes to my mind is, you look at where all of the corporations have gone in this industry and they really have starved the FTA down to where they can't hardly afford to run their own printing facility to train people like they originally had launched. And if all the converters would donate money into converting equipment and really standardize a training program on converting equipment, we would all benefit from that. Absolutely, Lou. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm happy to take this offline with you and really brainstorm around it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. On behalf of um, uh, DuPont and ESCO, I would like to thank all of you for your time and your insights. And um, I know that sometimes companies, it's kind of hard to share information with other companies, peers and competitors. And you did a great job. I really enjoyed the session. Dan, Lou, Paula, um, uh, Ronaldo, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now, uh, if you want to stay with me, uh, we are going to continue with our next session of the day. And uh, be soon, we are going to have Mark and Corey, who is going to join me in the next session, which is called um, Plate Exposure for Flexible Packaging. This, as I said, is going to be presented by Mark Sanford and Corey Devlin. Um, Mark, who needs introduction, joined NESCO back in 1997 to work on the development, marketing, and support of ESCO products like screening, curves, color management, and expanded gamut. He holds 11 patents in digital e-machine, including FlexoCal hybrid screening, plate cell patterning, concentric pressing, and Equinox ECG, and I'm still missing some of them. In 2011, <clears throat> he was inducted as a 49th member of the FTA Hall of Fame, and Mark received his bachelor's degree in printing science from, the, for, from RRT and his MBA from the University of Delaware. Um, Mark, how are you? Are you there with me? I'm doing good, uh, Julian. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, just fine, waiting for you. All and, right. Well, uh, and I know this is going to be a couple of beers for me. So, uh, Julian's referring to the fact that we bet on how long our presentations are going to be. I seem to always lose, but today I'm um, I'm dedicated to shortening it. I've taken out some slides from my last presentation, and I think I'm going to uh, get it so that you owe me a dinner and a beer. Let's so, see. Uh, hey, let's I want to start by me, don't start the me. clock yet because I have I want to ad lib a couple comments here. Can I do that? I have to introduce Corey first, Mark. Good so, point. Uh, who, 
Corey, <laughs> sorry, Corey, you know Mark. Already. That's all right. Good but, afternoon, good morning, <laughs> and good evening, everybody. <laughs> Corey has um, uh, been involved in the graphic industry for 36 years um, as part of the DuPont Imaging Technology. Corey specializes in color management, applied to proofing and color separation, supported and trained customers with textile printing and large format digital ink sheet printing. And in 2008, she joined Cyrel, um, the Flexo division, as part of the technical service consultants team. She technically supports field sales representatives and customers. She also gives training to customers at the CTC. And her skills include screening for Flexo and G7 for, pre, um, for press calibration and many others, I have to say. Corey, how are you? Thank you very, very much for being with me today. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Mark, you're on. <laughs> well, Corey, it's nice to do a webinar with you as a partner, right? Because you and I have been working together since the mid 80s. I know. <laughs> so we're not going to disclose our age or our weight, but we will say that we have been working together for a long time. Hey, I thought the last panel was great. Corey, did you catch most of that? Oh, yeah. I'm going to um, emphasize quite a bit on it. Um, Pallavi did an outstanding job, as did Orlando, Lou, and Dan. And you would almost think that we staged this uh, for them to say the things that we're going to talk about, right? Because they talked about flat top plates. Most of this, this one, entire presentation is really about the future of plates and they're all flat top plates. Uh, they talked about screening. We're gonna talk about screening. Uh, they talked about expanded gamut. Dan, you would think that we paid him to say that, the things he's saying about expanded gamut. Um, optimization, better ways to get curves and profiles, which was, um, critical. And on efficiency, the first thing that Dan mentioned was thermal plate processing. And you and I remember when people, I might have been among them, would say that, hey, you're never going to get <clears throat> a process quality plate out of a thermal system this, as you could get out of a solvent system. And I think a lot of people beg to differ, and we'll talk about some of the technologies that do that. But and let's it, also the, not forget about sustainability. That was a big thing. And I want to make sure we talk about that as well. Yeah. And, you know, Corey, um, sustainability, I remember people have talked about reducing waste and complying with federal requirements and all that. What's changed in my career 30 years ago, we all said that sarcastically. We rolled our eyes and thought it was something about trying to please big government. And now we kind of, mo many of us, hopefully most of us see that the future of our planet uh, relies on us learning to be sustainable and finding solutions. So, um, I think the attitude here, I didn't hear one sarcastic comment from this panel. And last week we had uh, Thomas uh, from Hub Label, and we also had a, a feature on hammer packaging. And they also said the sustainability was a very top priority. So, okay, Julian, now you can start the clock. Now that we are done our ad living, you can start the clock and we will see who owes who a beer or a dinner, right? I don't want to say that you're starting seven minutes late. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but you went a little longer too, Julian. Thank you, Corey. See, Corey has my back. All right. The main topic is LED plate exposure. And I'll get right into it. <clears throat> what is LED plate exposure? Um, it is a change, a fundamental change in the way we illuminate and expose a flexographic plate. In the past, we use bank lights. These are fluorescent tubes put in a bank, you can see the bank there. You can also see Corey there, my favorite model, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, this is taken in the DuPont lab in Chestnut Run, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, but that's a, a bank of mercury vapor fluorescent lights. High UV output generates a whole lot of heat, has a whole lot of inherent flaws, which until we had a better way of making plates, we had to kind of try to live with those inherent flaws. But the world's gonna be changing over the next couple of years to LED illumination, right? So we're gonna talk primarily about um, LED illumination, but it's enabling some technologies that we wanna hit on. So we're also gonna talk about crystal screening and the print control wizard. Uh, screening and optimization were two of the things that um, both Lou and Dan brought up in the last session. And we're also gonna talk about plate processing. I thought that was great when, when we came to the subject of efficiency, Dan, First thing he mentioned was thermal plate processing. So wide web film printing, He's uh, it's nice to see the wide web world starting to come along uh, with thermal plate processing as well. Um, and then Corey, you know, DuPont, 
makes more flexo plates, I think, than every other manufacturer put together. Um, they always wonder, is that good or bad? They kind of have to for some reasons. But there's a couple key plate materials, and she has condensed it to one slide with Cyril plate materials that most of you in wide web flexible packaging should consider. At the end of this, I'm going to show you a case study on SGS. Now, we have sold well over 200 um, LED exposure units, what we call the Crystal XPS. SGS was at the very beginning of the process in North America, and they liked it so much they put it in at two sites. So they have some insights as to how this technology works that um, few other operations have, so we chose to feature them. That's going to be at the end, but I want to thank them up front and um, uh, invite you all to stay for the whole uh, presentation so you can see what SGS is doing with this. But at the very highest level, you know, we talked about sustainability, and these are critical in packaging. I thought Pallavi made some fantastic comments on how the world needs to become more educated on them, starting with me, I'll admit. Um, but one of them is in illumination, right? So the world's in, in, in this, this, this revolution of illumination, and it's all based on an LED. What is an LED? A light-emitting diode. And that's the same light source that we have in our plate exposures. But this goes way beyond Flexo. Traffic applications, whether it's green lights and red lights, uh, whether it's the illumination of highways and, and streets, uh, displays and signage, whether it's a signage at Times Square in New York City or the display you're all looking at right now on just about any kind of computer you could be using today. Um, automotive and household lighting. I got to get my wife to convert. I was talking to Rory and Julian, and they all use LED lighting. And uh, I know my wife was saying, hey, it looks too blue and too sterile, and it's, I just don't like it. Well, now you can buy LED lighting, and on the, on the package, it'll tell you the color temperature. Makes me feel smart, right, when I, when I go shopping for light bulbs now. And, um, and, and the light bulbs are more expensive, but they last way, way, way longer, and they consume way, way, way less uh, light. Um, and our industry is not going to be immune to it, right? So um, the people that I know that know ink were telling me that any ink that is today cured by UV will be cured by LED within the next five years. Um, how accurate can this technology be controlled? Well, it's now the light source in spectrophotometers. Those are the world's most common spectrophotometer there. And even the illumination, the, the light booth industry will be moving to LED. And when it does, it'll be delivering more consistent, more uniform light with a more even color temperature. The fluorescent bank lights have some flaws that we've tried to learn to live with. They have speaks, uh, they have peaks, I should say, in the um, in the output band that we're trying to live with. But with LED, we'll have much better control on that stuff. Um, and quite a bit in the last um, uh, session, uh, the the panel, the town hall panel discussion, they talked about regulatory requirements. So the previous kinds of light bulbs, even for your house, you know, these tungsten filament bulbs and these fluorescent bulbs are all gonna be subject to more and more critical uh, regulatory requirements. So um, it's time to start looking now at, at technology that can replace that. And it so happens to be that this technology makes a better plate. So, you know, we all, we all kind of think of, oh, if it's more sustainable and it's more economical, then it, you've got to be sacrificing quality. Uh, that's not the case. In fact, um, uh, the technology we're going to talk about, our Crystal XPS Exposure Unit, has won every award that we've entered it in. And many of these awards, we had to show examples of the quality that you can produce. Now, what you see there is a um, 4835 unit. This session today is on flexible packaging, which is mostly wide web film. Last week we did one on labels, and this is this this is the device that they all make. You're all considered wide web film, and most of you are large format. So you might be interested in the 4835, but really we have it available for narrow web and wide web. So the, the wide web unit, the same core technology, the CDI is basically the same, same laser, same optics, same automated workflow, right? Uh, but connected to an XPS uh, unit, which is actually much, much larger, right? And coming soon, for those of you who don't need 50 by 80, want a size that's smaller than that, coming soon will be the 42 by 60. So that, the 4260 XPS will be out in the next few weeks, and the CDI is going to be following that um, early next year. 
So let's take apart these components. You know, our talk today is really not on CDIs. We've done many, many talks on CDIs. Um, it's on exposure. So today, regardless of your imager, you can have any ESCO imager that we make, which is about 18 of them. I think Rory showed that slide yesterday. You can image a plate on any of those. You can expose that plate on an XPS exposure unit. So this unit works standalone. But if you want, we are designing these systems so that they fit together for an automated workflow. And I'll talk about some of the, the design enhancements there. So XPS crystal plate exposure LED works on its own or works in conjunction with the crystal CDI. And those of you who saw Rory's movie yesterday saw how the crystal CDI can automatically load and unload and how the plate handler, uh, which Rory made this slide for me, uh, the plate handler will move that plate from the crystal CDI to the XPS. And since they're all being controlled um, through the same network system, it can tell the XPS what plate it is and to expose it automatically, right? So, you know, what are the key points of, of the crystal XPS exposure? I think there's two big key points. It's a better plate because it's more even illumination and has uh, a lot of the benefits we'll talk about, but it's, it's really built for um, connectivity. So just to give you um, an understanding of how this works, because many of us have seen bank lights and they're kind of static in nature, the, that big bank of bulbs and that clamshell sits there and exposes. This technology, you have a moving light source, right? And the light source is in this UV head. And in there, you have the main exposure coming from the top. You have the back exposure coming from the bottom. And as you saw in the previous movie, that head is traveling uh, back and forth uh, along that track there. And we're going to talk about consistency. And the consistency comes from two basic concepts. One is instead of having banks of lights that vary, which Corey's going to talk about, we have LED bulbs that are put together in a matrix. It's very, very small. Many very small LED bulbs that are put together in a matrix that are evenly spaced. And then we move the head back and forth uh, to get even more random exposure. So there's our digital main and back exposure. And if you look at, we've built these machines for real easy maintenance. So if something needs to be replaced in that head, it's very easy for the technician to do it. So all the, the glass and the exposure um, hardware is easily accessible. And then all the electronic components are easily accessible. So it's very easy for the ESCO tech to get in there and fix anything that needs repaired. Now, if you look at it from the user's perspective, I want to point out two things. First of all, it's the optimum height. So this works for anybody who's, let's say, between four and a half feet and six and a half feet tall. It's, a, it's, it's got a big range there. And it's built to be the same size as the CDI. And then the touchscreen operation is the easiest user interface that any plate maker I've ever talked to has ever seen. In fact, I was asking a plate maker at Hammer, why don't you teach me how to use the XPS? And he said, there's nothing to teach. You just type in the plate you want to expose. So he typed in, in his case, it was 45,000 EFX, and you hit start. And um, so I, just to be a smart aleck, I had to take out a notepad and start copying notes uh, down in front of him. So <laughs> it's, it's very, very easy to use. And Corey, do you want to talk about why LED from DuPont's perspective? Yes, I will. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, why LED? The most important thing is the consistency. But we've also been talking about sustainability. So what does the LED technology give you? It's more energy efficient. Mm. Oh, it's 10 times longer life lifespan. So the lamps last longer or the diodes last longer. It's energy efficient. No warm up needed, so less time. It's less heat involved in making the plates, and there's actually no mercury in these LEDs. So this really create, helps with sustainability and easier to use. So these, um, you know, your mercury vapor tubes, fluorescent tubes, they the, disposing them has to comply with like local, state, and federal regulations for hazardous waste, doesn't Correct. it, Corey? Yes, yes. You can't yeah. just dispose them into your garbage cans. Where with diodes, you are able to just get rid of them yeah. the way you would normal garbage. Normal landfill, right? Normal landfill, yep. 
So before we get started, let's just talk about the normal way we make plates. And again, the XPS uses the same methodology. You have back exposure that's taking place and a main exposure. And again, this is all with UVA light. The first thing that we need to do is typically you back expose the raw plate material and you have a lambs layer where the image is ablated from. And when you back expose a plate, you're creating the floor height. And when you're doing your main exposure, you're actually creating the plate relief and you're creating your dot shape from the surface and you're creating your dot shoulder. So again, we're using the same concepts when we're making plates. You do a back exposure and you do your main exposure, creating the floor, the relief, and the plate material. Another thing that's important is the efficiency of the back exposure and how well you make your plates. The floor, if the floor is too high or too low, excuse me, what you will see is the dots are not stable enough. You might be able to be printing on the side of the dot. You're just not stable dot. If the floor is too high, then what you could have happening is you would create dirty printing because you may be filling up the ink on the surface, floor surface and being going back to the surface of the plate. So again, it's the quality of the print. Each type, the floor height, if it's too low or too high, can create dirty printing. So it's You know, it's funny, Corey, when I ask the people, you know, well, why don't you use less and less relief uh, in the plate room? They're like, because the press room is going to give us a hard time, right? Because the press room Absolutely. is going to come in here and start complaining. So, uh, you know, the pressmen, um, they they want to have uh, sufficient relief, don't they? Yes, and they want it to be consistent from left to right all throughout the plate making process. And again, dirty printing is probably one of the biggest things that we're called in to, um, to, to fix and to what's causing this and how do we fix this. And that's usually done through the optimization process. So here we're going to talk about why and helps that consistency for the floor. But let's talk about bank lights first. And the bank lights have individual tubes. So each tube has different distance between them and you have an irradiance that comes out of those lamps. And that irradiance may not be consistent across the, from each tube to tube and within the tube. So you need to make sure that you're keeping the lamps warmed up to a certain height or level. And the other thing that's important to realize that over time, that efficiency goes down so around 300 to 500 hours, you may have to replace those lamps. Now with an LED technology, you have equal illumination or radiance across that entire bed because it's digitally controlled. So you really have consistency across that plate surface. And over time, I mean, we haven't hit this yet. 5,000 hours is maybe the maximum. I don't know of a customer yet that's had to change a diode. Have you, Mark? No, I was talking to um, Chuck Schoen from SGS. And he's maybe the most experienced plate maker I've ever met. Al Bowers claims that he is, in fact, whatever Al says, I believe. Um, and um, he said they're way over 7,000 hours now. And and they run it 24-7 for three years. They've been running like 24-7 for three years in that unit. So um, the other thing, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mark. But the other thing is that when you have to replace your lamps, you have to warm them up. So you don't even have that warm up time when you're changing lamps with an LED system. You just replace the diode and digitally it's back into a line and you'll get consistent relief again. So let's talk about another reason why the UV um, tubes versus the LED and what causes that variation. So one thing to understand, the FDA has a spec or we have a spec plate customer that we like 20 thousandths relief is a standard relief for a plate. However, we have variability and typically we will say we'll get a variability between 18 thousandths to 22 thousandths. And that's what we would like to range, but actually we even have more of that variability plus or minus two because of the inconsistency. If you don't warm up the lamps correctly, if the lamps are aging, that you will actually even have more relief than you want or variability in your floor. Um, Mark, can you hear me still? I can, Corey. I just lost you guys. Um, so you can't, you can't, you can't see that. I got it. Okay. okay. I got you back. Okay, good. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, everybody. I have a old, I'm on a hot spot right now where I'm working. So but hopefully I don't lose you. But with the XPS system, you actually have very tight tolerance, plus or minus one thousandths of an inch. No, thousandths of an inch. Yeah, so that's hard great. to believe. You know, Corey, I did not want to say that in a webinar in front of a few hundred people. But I've talked to numerous people and they say it's true. You can say it. And Chuck, back to Chuck Schoen of SGS, he said one of the most amazing things is if you can go over and type into the unit, you want 18 thousandths relief, make a plate, it'll be 18 thousandths. You type in 20 thousandths, make a plate, it'll be 20 thousandths. You type in 22, you get 22. So, and um, another thing, yes. And you don't have to warm up your lamps to make sure you're assured having that even relief. That's really one of the things with bank light systems is if you're not warmed up to the same temperature each time you're making a plate, you could have variability. Yeah. So what are the benefits? You know, that it's a digital back exposure. So your typography is independent of the time of the day, the UV tube output and the temperature. It's consistent. Mm -hmm. And the plate relief, like I said earlier, is, is repeatable for one thousandths of an inch. It's more consistency for the press operator. It's just a nice um, floor height. And uh, like I said earlier, there's no preheating of the tube and there's no UV tube exchange or disposal. You don't have to worry about that. And then the other thing that's important is this dwell time. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we mean by consistent dwell time. You know, Corey, um, it's easiest to see the um, inconsistency of bank lights by measuring the floor, right? Absolutely, yeah. So if you measure the floor, the floor and it across a, an 80 inch plate and it has four thousandths of variation, you're gonna have that same variation in the main exposure too. But there's no yeah. simple way to see that in the main exposure. So you might have 1% dots on the top left part of your plate that are holding. You may have 1% dots on the bottom right part of your plate that are not holding. And you'll never actually know that until you get the press, right? And you may, even at press, you may not know why it's not holding. Not holding, right, exactly. And another factor is this dwell time that causes this inconsistency that goes on. So okay, well, what is dwell time. time anyway, Corey? The distance or the time between main exposure and back exposure. And when I make plates in the CTC, I have a routine, a, the way that I do it. And so that I'm trying to always make sure I have the same dwell time between my main exposure and my back exposure. But I'm not making near as many plates as people at SGS, let's say, is making today or many of the wide web flexible packaging customers. So they may get interruption. And what you can have happen is if you have different time, you'll have a broader shoulder on the less from the main exposure to the back exposure. But when it's over time, your dot actually becomes smaller and your shoulders become less broad. So that time difference is really important. And I've seen this because when I first started making plates at the lab back in 2008, I would have some people help me make plates. And I found out some people made a bunch of plates back exposed. They did all eight colors or seven colors, back exposed them all. And then they would image their plates and then later they would start main exposing them. So each plate had a different dwell time. And I was like, wow, I'm trying to figure out why my dots are different. And this is really what it was, is the difference of time between main exposure and back exposure. Yeah, there's no way to make a plate with a different dwell time on an XPS. Right, exactly. It's time, It's less than one minute. You know, you're there. It's back to back. So it's, it's really a consistent way of making plates so that, you know, you get dot stability and you get consistency to me to having that same dot size from plate to plate to plate and knowing that I'm having the same relief just helps that press operator and the plate room, you know, when you're measuring your plates and measuring. And just like this, we have Allie here. She's looking at min dots. And, you know, that's something we're always analyzing is our min dot. Is it holding on the plate? And here on the left, you see unstable highlight dots. Now, that could be due to not having a big enough dot, but it could also be due to the dwell time. You know, is that dot holding because there's been a difference in time? And here we have a stable highlight on the right. And it, when we're looking at plates, in the lab or customers, the highlight dot is probably the most important part of the printing process to be stable. 
Yeah. And um, once you set your um, exposure and you know you can hold a whatever, a 0.8% dot of a um, C16 screen at 175 line, you'll be able to hold that all the time everywhere on your plate. Right. And it's day yeah. in, day out. And I know it's going to be good. But with the bank light -like system, I really have to make sure I'm doing everything consistent and my UVA output the same. And so that I don't have this dreaded fade out circular gradient that I'm worried, did the dot hold? Is the dot leaning over? Do I have too much relief? Do I not have enough relief? That all affects printing. So here we have an example of bank lights where when we did the exposure here, we did the back exposure and then we main exposure within five minutes. And on the right hand side, uh, the operator got busy, they forgot, they went to lunch. So they then later did their main exposure and it's a 60 minute difference or one hour difference. Notice the difference of the dots. The dots on the right are leaning over and the dots on the left you know, are more stable. But here on the Crystal XBS LED, look, it's again, it's gonna be consistent over time because the dwell time is consistent between plate to plate. Another thing that happens with um, bank lights is the light source is directional. The lamps go all in one direction. So you're always having the same um, quality of dot. And you're not sure if it's all reflected the same direction on the plate. With the XPS, because it's a moving and each dot gets hit the same way, you have more of a consistent non-directional um, dot shape. And yeah, and you know, Corey, it's ahead. also more like a cone, isn't it? Like a, a regular yeah. dot. Um, Julian was actually showing me some pictures he had yesterday. Um, a regular dot, it's kind of a concave um, a dot structure where the, uh, the the LED dot is more co more cone shaped and it gives yeah. it better support. Good point. And you want to talk about illumination, you know, an LED flashlight, if you look at that, or your LED lights in cars. It's a consistent light and it's always the same, no matter how you don't have a battery, let's say like that. So again, why do we like the XPS system? I guess the main thing is I'm consistent plate, so I have less waste. I'm getting the same quality from plate to plate. The consistent dwell time helps me get exposure consistency. And another thing we didn't mention is every plate that goes through an XPS system will be a flat top dot in the plate. And also definitely it supports Pixel Plus and HD screens. But now with the XPS, they have created these new screens called Crystal Screens. All right. That's what, it's your turn, Mark. Called Crystal Screens. Okay, let's talk about Crystal Screens a little bit here, right? Um, all of these topics could be just separate webinars in and of themselves. And in fact, I'm giving a webinar on crystal screening for the FTA, actually. Um, and I think that's on October 18th. So check your the FTA website if you're interested in that. Um, let's, let's try to give everybody an understanding of crystal screening without doing a complete webinar on crystal screening so that I can win my bet from Julian, right? Ah, so, I'm going to slow it down so I, you don't win the bet. <laughs> Well, it's fun to have a beer with Julian and a dinner, even if I have to pay for it. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. So what is crystal screening? You know, when crystal screening was first introduced, I went out and told everybody crystal screens are screens with cell patterns throughout the entire plate. Now we have lots of crystal screens with cell patterns throughout the entire plate. That means in solids and in dots. And that means in a dot, you don't have a protection ring where you have an area of no cell. Um, or you don't have a fade parameter. But we've introduced other crystal screens for labels and other applications which do not have cells. So I think the, the best de definition of a crystal screen, as we move forward, all the new screens ESCO comes out with are gonna be called crystal screens. You can make any of those screens using our print control wizard. And I think there's two things to think about here. One is they are all transitional screens. And the other is they all have the option of putting surface patterns and there's neat things you can do with these surface patterns. So let's just first start uh, and we'll talk about transitional screens. Well, there is an AM screen, right? So in an AM screen, all the dots are equally spaced. So in a 150 line screen, there's 150 dots in an inch. 
they vary in size. On your left, you have really small dots that you might have been able to hold on plate, and on your right, you have very large dots. Now, let's take a look at an FM screen. An FM screen, all the dots are the same size, but they vary in distance. So whether you're talking about the very, very highlight there or down into the midtone in the shadow, where they start to group together down there and kind of make different shapes, but all the dots are the same size. Right? And the problem with a regular FM screen is it can look grainy. And if you try to order these in closer to an AM screen, you can get some patterning in these screens, right? So ESCO, about 20 years ago, created and patented the first transitional or the first hybrid screens, right? And ESCO still owns those, those patents today, right? Um, and what is that? What is a transitional screen? Let's think about this. As you go from right to left, your dots are getting smaller and smaller. At a certain size, and that's a variable that we can choose with ESCO, here it's, n it's nine pixels. At, n at a nine pixel size, we can start to do something different with that. And we and, and just think about this. Let's say that with a certain plate on a certain exposure unit and a certain press, let's say that we knew that dots below nine pixels created problems. Well, we could switch to an FM screen at that point and keep the dots at nine pixels and just use less of, less of them. So whether we're at a 0.1% or a 2.5%, either one, we're still going to have a dot that's the same size. Now, it would be really nice if the world of flexo imaging was so predictable, you could just tell the rip, make a nine pixel dot at it and I can hold any of them. But what we really know is as you go smaller and you become more isolated, you can't hold as small of a dot. So it might be that at 2%, at you can hold a nine pixel dot, but at a 10th of a percent, you cannot. And then the world of min dot optimization gets kind of complicated. But I want to just give you a little bit of exposure to it. We're not going to solve that now. These are different transitional screens. And we have transitional screens with big dots and small dots, with support dots and without support dots. But the general trend and, and what's really pushing this now is flat top dot plates and LED exposure. The general trend is to go with smaller FM dots, right? To shorten that transition range. So we, we want to use a dot that's not like 50 pixels in size. Here's a nine pixel dot. I've imaged some of them. We had a, a we had a pixel to each side there, three pixels, and we have a 12 pixel spot. So we're going to generally wind up with transitional screens where the highlight is fixed somewhere between 12 pixels and let's say 25 pixels. And with an XPS unit, let's take a 25 pixel dot. A 25 pixel dot on a bank light would look grainy to your eye, but a 25 pixel dot on an XPS would not look grainy, grainy or to your eye because it's more stable. It, it's actually a little bit smaller on the plate. We've measured many of them and it prints smaller. So you're gonna have less grain with that. But let's take a look at MinDot a little bit more closely here. And just to show you some of the concepts uh, that we're working with, you know, on an AM screen, min dot is pretty simple. The smaller you get, the smaller the dot, right? I mean, it's a, it's, if it's a 100 line screen, there's 100 of them in an inch, and you just have to figure out below a certain value, you can't hold them on plate and print them. So you can go in and set your min dot, and, and that's pretty straightforward. On an FM dot, it's a whole different animal. So the first thing I want to say is one of the reasons to go to an FM dot in your highlight is you can hold much, much smaller dots. So typically on an XPS, we're somewhere around a, a 0.5 to 1. In, I'd say 90% of our plates are between 0.5 and 1 in that sweet spot. If it were an AM screen, pretty much most plates would be like somewhere between 1.5 and, and 2.5 and to get a nice min dot. But when we go from, let's say, 0.8 down to 0.4, as you can see, it's the same exact dot size. All we're doing is we're using less of those dots. So we can put them side by side, but again, it's the same uh, dot size here. This is a C25 dot. If you were to count all the pixels in there, you would count 25 pixels. And let's look at how these two dimensions of the min dot kind of work to make uh, the choice of min dot a bit more complex than it would be in an AM. 
So here's a C25 dot. That's about as large as we're gonna go uh, with our transitional screen, um, our crystal screen, we can say, with an XPS unit. Um, and then let's, let's look at a C12. We do have customers using C12. That I had a customer print C9 for some tests we were doing, and it looked like beautiful high-end reviewer. And when it went time for them to choose what they wanted to use in production, they chose like C19 or C22 because they wanted a more robust dot shape. So it's not just about looks. Um, but if we measure that dot, that's going to be 25 pixels. C25 is 25 pixels. And crystal C12 is going to be 12 pixels. So there's two variables. We need to tell it what pixel size we want, and we need to tell it what percentage we want. There's two things, whereas in the past, all we, with an AM screen, we just told it the size, right? And that's where the print control wizard comes in to help. And this could be, of course, a, a presentation on its own, but I'm gonna just show you some of the elements of this. Here's a min.control control patch, and we'll look at a nine pixel spot, and we'll look at a 16 pixel spot, right? And somewhere in there is going to be our optimal spot. But now we're going to look at the population. So we can have an AM screen. We can delete half of the dots of the AM screen. Or we can delete three quarters of the dots of the AM screen. And you can set your min dot to delete even more than that if you want. But the point is here, like somebody thought, well, that's easy because the full screen is always 1%. No, no, no. The full screen value depends on your screen rolling, here I'm showing 155 line, and your spot size. So if I were to do this at C9, there would be different, it wouldn't be 2.4, 1.2, and 0.6, it be smaller numbers. If I did it at a larger value, if I did this at C25, it'd be the, the one, the, um, the, the full screen point, the no deletion point would be higher, it'd be up around 4% or something like that. So these are very complex things for a human to do um, but the print control wizard, of course, is a computer and it can do that easily for you. And what you can see on the chart is just uh, some visual elements to make sure that the computer's, uh, you know, the, the software algorithm is picking the right spot. And um, here we're going all the way to zero. Everyone out here who knows Flexo or is trying to learn about Flexo probably knows that the hardest thing to do is to fade to zero. Um, it's, it's better done than I've ever seen it with LED plate exposure. Um, still a challenging, and, and it's not just about typing in a 0% dot. It's really about finding your optimum because on many conditions, going all the way to zero can get you a darker dot. Those dots become unstable and fall over and you can actually um, have a darker dot. Let me talk just a little bit about surface patterns and um, then I'll hand it back to uh, Corey. So um, I thought one of the interesting things in the last discussion was to talk about analog rolls, cleaning analog rolls with laser cleaning technology, right? And QCing them to make sure the volumes are consistent. Um, you know, the world of flex cell is based on the fact that cells um, carry more uniform films of ink. And ESCO has the original patents for putting those cells in solids. Most of us who print on wide web film, Paper, not so much, right? But when you're printing on wide web film that doesn't like ink, you get much better surfaces, uh, much better solids, much smoother solids when you have a cell in the plate. This is gonna become increasingly true as we look to compostable uh, and biodegradable and sustainable and environmentally friendly uh, films, right? And we have been putting cells in dots for a number of years at ESCO. And, and for numerous reasons, we always had a protection ring around the dot. The biggest reason was because if you don't have a protection ring, you can get a moiré pattern between your cells and your screen rolling. But we figured out some technology. You can read our patents if you really want to know. I'll, I'll mention it briefly. We can move the cells a little bit off the grid. We can move the dots a little bit off the grid, just enough so that you don't get that interference pattern. And when you do that, you can have cells throughout the entire plate. Now, this is about as good of a solid dot as you're gonna get on film on the left. You have these small areas of ink pulling out. And the reason you have that, uh, that could be called a donut dot, is there's like a hydraulic vacuum that occurs. You have a solid plate dot and a non-porous substrate. Whenever they make contact and pull apart, you're pulling some ink out. 
But the crystal dot, remember, has that cell pattern everywhere. So there's some place for the ink to go. It just fills in the cells, and it can go all the way to the edge of the dot. It doesn't clog up there. So we can get much better highlight uh, dot shape, and I'll show you some of that. But really, we can go beyond that because we have the capability to use different cells. The screen rolling we're going to use for the WSI pattern is 1,414 lines per inch, so well above the screen rolling of any analog roller. Um, and we can change the size of the dots on our mask. So these, these cells are imaged when we image a plate on the CDI. And um, we have everybody perform what is called a pixel boost step test. So this is the mask of the CDI. This is if we took a raw plate, put it in our CDI, went into the step program, told it we want to step at seven across or whatever that is, um, and told it we want to start at 160 and step in 20 unit increments, we'd get a plate that looks like that, a mask that looks like that, expose that on an um, XPS, process it, which Corey's going to uh, talk about next, and, and print it. But right now, just so that you have some understanding of how this works, I'm going to show you the different cell sizes that you get when you give different amounts of exposure. So remember, the pixel boost, the laser is ablating it. So at a certain point, right around 240, maybe slightly higher in this example here, um, the dots are connecting and they're forming cells that are completely surrounded by land. Now, which one of those is the best? That depends on your printing additions. But I'll tell you now, it's right around 240 to 250, and somewhere between 240 and 280 in this example. But if you really want to optimize it, you can print that, right? And I'll just, just to, to, to be quick here, um, I will show you um, different densities taken of a pixel boost step test, right? So with no pixel boost whatsoever, you have a very low density. With a maximum pixel boost, becomes like a normal solid, you have a, a very low density. And somewhere in between, you have a range. It's not, you know, there's not one number, you know, 182 that gives you the optimum. You have a, usually a pretty good range here, and you can optimize density. But you're also going to look at other things, um, which I'll show you with some of the SGS work that they uh, have allowed us to share, uh, which shows um, highlight or dot quality, reverses, spine type, things like that. So with that, um, Corey, let's talk about that. So we've made a plate now. Uh, we've imaged a plate on a CDI. We've exposed it on a crystal XPS exposure unit. Now we need to process it. Should we start? Should we go back to that? Yes, absolutely. Let's go to that fast pl plate processing system. And here we have a fast processor. And again, it's environmentally friendly. We heard a lot about sustainability. So this really eliminates the use of solids, solvents. The other important factor to me is time. It's just in time plate making. So if you have short runs and you don't wanna to have to take down the press, you can have another plate to replace a plate if it got damaged somehow, that you would be able to have a plate in less than 45 minutes to go back on press. And that's very important to um, a press room. So how do we make plates? Oh, the, the thing about the faster um, plate making system is faster, faster processing. Like I said, it's 45 minutes. It's um, dry, no drying time, quicker for turnaround. It also is a cost saving. You're reducing your energy consumption. And you also reduce waste because you don't have solvents to get rid of. It takes a smaller footprint. This again is important for the environment, less greenhouse emissions, reduces renewable energy. And it's also energy efficient, which is very important. Yeah, and, and Corey, you can, I can see this. Um, one thing about you, the reason I respect you more than I respect myself, you actually make plates. You do all the theory, right? And you actually make plates, which is why, I, like when you were telling me how much you love the XPS the other day, I was music to my ears. But I go into a plate room with one of these big car wash systems, and they make beautiful plates. I don't want to say anything negative. We have our partners make these systems. Um, but you compare that, you know, and it's look at the, the size. size of that. Yeah, and then absolutely. <laughs> look at the size of a TD 2000, right? Right, exactly. So it's yeah. a huge That's difference. That's very important. In and the other thing is that it's improved performance. Even like Dan said in his er earlier um, session, he said that the print performance is getting comparable to solvent. So that's really important. And again, to have that plate so quickly. Again, the steps in making a plate, 
from a file system, you'd have the plate, you'd image it on the CDI, you would expose that on the XPS system and immediately go to the plate making process or the TD system. So it's a faster workflow, it's simplified. Again, getting operators, they were talking about that, and labor, you know, you need less steps or for less operators. And again, even with the XPS system, it's, it's more automated than what it was when you had to do back expose, main expose, so forth. And again, no solvent, which is very important to the environment and for sustainability. And it reduces the time, so just in time plate making. So let's talk about the difference in the time. Again, we talked about earlier, you first do your back exposure, then you do your main exposure. Then the next thing is processing the plate, either being solvent or fast. And you have your drying if you're doing solvent. And then you always need to do your finishing, post exposure and light finishing. And all of those things take time. So for solvent workflow, your main exposure time or your back exposure time is one minute. Your main exposure time might be 10 to 12 minutes. Then your um, processing time, because of the fact that we're using solvents, is gonna take about 20 to 40 minutes to get it through the processor, depending on the gauge. And then the drying time also depends on gauge. What I mean by that is the thickness of the plate it can take up to 120 to 180 minutes. And then you have to post expose and finish. Solvent plates take longer because they need to remove the tack. So you have three plus hours before you can have a plate ready for press. But the biggest factor is the time, 120 to 180 minutes. Now, when we go to a thermal process, it's gonna be the same back exposure time, one minute. It's gonna be the same exposure time because we're using the same plate and we're comparing the solvent versus fast. And then, but here for processing, because we're going through thermal, it's only gonna take 12 minutes, which is much shorter time, and then no drying. So that can be niched. You still need a post finish and light finish, but that's less because your plates aren't near as tacky because of there's no solvents involved. And as well, that time is 30 minutes. So again, just in time plate making, you have no drying, it's, it's better for the environment. So there's a lot of benefits to going to a thermal fast workflow. So that time is less. Another important thing that we talked about, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, is about the throughput time. With conventional, with let's say um, with bank lights, you have your take your plate from storage, and then you have to do your back exposure time. Then from that, you need to image your plate, but then you go back to that same exposure unit. So you have a main exposure that can be a bottleneck. That also can create dwell time. And that is your processor that you process. With the XPS system, you go from storage, then you go right to your XPS system. You image it, goes over to the exposure. Again, you have consistency with the dwell time, and then you go through the processor. So every plate's the same. I think what's neat, Corey, is like, if you do a time comparison between XPS and conventional, XPS will win by a little bit, but not a whole lot if it's just a straightforward time comparison. But what's hard to do in a comparison is to put in your traffic jams. Right, right? exactly. And if you say, okay, every, you know, 20% of my plates when I'm done imaging are the, 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 the exposure units being taken up, let's say, by another plate or something like that. If you start to put in numbers like that, the more traffic jams you have, the faster or the bigger the difference between the XPS workflow and the conventional. And also, you have to remember that dwell time is going to be variable. For yeah, the, affecting uh, quality. Yes. So again, sustainability is very, very important to DuPont. Um, again, that was big um, conversation earlier, and I was happy to hear that. Um, again, the fast process will help you be more sustain sustainable in your plate making system. So here are some numbers that I think is very important to you that the fast uses 37% of the energy that a solvent uses, which is actually 63% less, which is really nice for the environment and for the customers. And then when you're talking about um, green gas, greenhouse gases, the fast uses 40%, 47% of the greenhouse gases, which is 53% less. So that's a big savings and that's good for the people on the West Coast and when people are being measured 
for their solvents and um, what the plate the legislation is doing. This one is the one that I find hard to believe, but I know DuPont um, because they are sticklers for data at DuPont. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I know that they, they have to have it right because it's coming from it's coming from your slide. But um, um, right. the VOC difference is unbelievable. Right. So, you know, the VOCs from going from the just from fast, our first generation, we saved 98 percent. But then with the release of our newer fast systems on um, the TD models that we have so saved another 76 percent from that which is giving us even greater um, capability or sustainability in the plate making room and for the customer. So in the last five years, this is important, Cyrell Fast Processors has helped reduce CO2 emissions equivalent to 109 million fewer, fewer miles driven by passenger cars. So you can have more cars in California, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is good about that is that, um, to me, when you get into these big giant numbers on carbon footprints and stuff, it kind of loses meaning, right? Um, right. So this is an attempt to kind of show that a, a, it's everyone can see car exhaust, right? I mean, um, and anyone who's been in LA in the '80s and '90s could hardly breathe there. Now we now I can actually breathe in Los Angeles. So there's some parts of the world that are getting better. Well, look at electric cars and the hybrid cars. So, you know, they had to change as well for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the common marks that I was going to talk about, the common plates that we use in the wide web or flexible market segment, yes. you know, we have the fast thermal process plates. And typically those are now our easy plate, which is a flat top dot built into the plate, which with this type of plate, you have better dwell time or access time on the um, XPS system. But we also have a plate that commonly used DFR and also a DFM plate. The difference between the plates is basically the durometer or the hardness of the plate. All of these plates in an XPS system will become a flat top dot. In the solvent process world, we have the EPR2 as well as DPR and um, the DPL plate materials. Again, the difference between these plates is the durometer um, and Again, all plates on the XPS system will be a flat top dot. Speaking of EFX, um, I'm going to show you three case studies. This is this audience that we have today is flexible packaging, which is mostly wide web. So I'm, I'm not going to show you the entire case study of the two narrow web printers. Um, but both of these used EFX um, and processed with solvent and had um, XPS exposure units. I only want to show you one or two. My, my biggest my biggest slides of interest, let's say, from these two case studies. So both, by the way, both of these accounts print on film. It's just not wide web film, right? And um, here's a picture of Kirk with his 4835 XPS unit exposing a plate there. If you talk to Kurt, he never wants to go back to bank light, right? I mean, here's a picture of his system. So he, they have a um, 4835 crystal, um, crystal CDI right connected in line with the XPS, right? So he's kind of spoiled there. He just exposes the plate. He uses the automatic load and unload that Rory showed yesterday. Um, and then he slides the plate with his hands down to the um, exposure unit. And um, there's a lot we could talk about it. Anybody who wants to see this, contact your ex ESCO sales rep and I'll show you the whole detailed talk on it. Um, but we use the print control wizard to give us our parameters. And we used a um, C19 dot at a 175 line screen at an 0.8% min dot. And um, then we proceeded to make our curves test and we used offset images. So the three images that you see there are not flexo corrected or anything like that. They're right from the Idea Alliance G7 website. And um, there's dropouts everywhere. So to print that, one of the hardest things to print is like a white piece of China. Um, and um, to do that, you know, that's on this, um, that's on this form right there. It's a white piece of China. Um, to do that requires you to be able to fade to zero and print clean highlights. And I still have these samples. It, it just looked like, because I do G7 certifications and stuff for Flexo and offset. And this just looked like offset printing. So I thought that was the neatest thing to share from um, from from hub labels hub is a great place love to go there um and hammer packaging is really a huge label printer right they have two facilities this one is in one of the technology parks that surrounds rit 
in Rochester, New York. They also have a, a large Flexo facility in, in one of the old Kodak technology parks, uh, which is now Rochester Technology Park. Um, they have, um, there's Tim exposing a plate on their 4835. So they, have, they had a Spark, which they had bought like three or four years ago, and it was in good condition. We just upgraded the optics so that it could work with Pixel Plus. And um, here's um, Tim exposing a plate on the 4835 uh, XPS. And um, just to, like what it I think was the biggest, there was a lot of neat things to talk about Hammer, and it could, of course, this could be a really long discussion. Um, but I thought that kind of the biggest single slide, if I forced myself to only show one, was the difference between a normal screen and a crystal screen. They're dedicated. They have a major, both of these companies have a major commitment to the environment. So they are dedicated to using thermal processing. You can't even talk about solvent processing to them. Um, and um, they were not able to use the EFX uh, with their thermal processing prior to the XPS exposure, prior to LED plate exposure. So this is a, this is a plate, this is our step test, exposed on an LED exposure unit, on our XPS unit that I showed you. And look at the difference between the normal dot on the left and the crystal dot on the right. Beautiful, beautiful dots. And their four color work is just gorgeous, uh, you, you can see. But really for the, um, the case study for the wide web, I wanted to pick a customer uh, that had, had done hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, in production with XPS exposure. And um, there's probably other customers that could fit this. And let me just apologize to any um, who um, want, maybe wanted to be in this and were not. If you send me an email, I'll try to include you in the future one. Um, but I think SGS, I want to thank them for doing it because in, in a way they're kind of giving away some of their secrets here. Uh, and, and you know, what is their real incentive to do this? Try to make the world of Flexo and the world of packaging a better place. Um, but those of you who know SGS know that they're into every aspect of brand management. They do artwork and pre-press. They do image carriers, Gravero cylinders, flexo plates. Uh, they have their own photo studios. They do 3D computer um, graphic imaging. They do real physical comps and mock-ups. They have large format. They have print quality management. They do GMI, they do G7, they do just about any kind of print quality management you can um, uh, conceive of, and they do consulting, and they're always looking for innovation, and that drive for innovation is kind of what pushed them, uh, according to uh, Chris Walker, into looking at exposure technologies. So um, let's take a look at the image carriers here, and you know, the um, image carrier we're talking about is a flexographic plate. They also image your cylinders and other um, cylinders. But they have like 60 locations worldwide, maybe more than that now, 3,000 employees. Um, but I want to talk about two locations. I want to talk about Mississauga, which is really just the north side of Toronto. <clears throat> and I want to talk about Minneapolis, Minnesota. So Minneapolis, Minnesota, for anyone who's ever been there, it is a first-class facility. It's a really nice place to work. It's a really nice place to visit. It's a nice place to conduct training, which I have done with them, or attend training, which they do for all their customers. Um, and their plate room is amazing. This is just a small section of the plate room. I asked Chuck Schoen to uh, take a picture of the whole plate room. And, and right now, as we speak, he's trying to find a wide angle lens. This plate room has six CDIs, uh, six exposure units, um, and, and it's, it's enormous. And he couldn't find a, a way to take a picture of it uh, that did it any justice. But if you ask Chuck and um, you ask Rick Best, that's Rick uh, standing next to Chuck, you know, what is your favorite technology in your plate room? In one second, they'll say Crystal XPS. That's that's the best technology in our plate room. They've had it for like three years and let, have done literally hundreds of thousands of jobs, right? This unit on your right has w way over 5,000. He thinks it's around seven to 8,000 hours. Now, compare that to a bank light, which has about 500 or less hours, right? So we're talking... Um, 15 times, of, around 15 times the exposure. So I'll, I'll just read um, Chuck's uh, quote. ESCO CDI and XPS Crystal Technologies produce the most consistent plates that I've seen in 32 years of working and managing flexo plate rooms, right? And um, Chris Walker would concur with that as would uh, Rick Best. Um, just just a, a major leap forward in, in technology. Um, a lot of you probably know Scott because he speaks at FTA events and the color conferences and things like that. 
Um, and Scott is, um, um, he, his major role is to try to put together the best possible solution of technologies for the brand. So he works with brands and he works with converters. And he tries to put together, um, as I said, the best, the best possible solution. So he, his quote was, Crystal XPS technology brings value to the entire supply chain from brand to converter. It enables Flexo to compete with other high-end printing processes. So uh, Scott's also a diplomat for those of you who know him, and he does not want to say what other high-end printing process uh, that Flexo competes with, but he's kind of obligated when he's working with brands, um, he's obligated to use Flexo for the economics if, if he can get the, hot, the same quality as he can get with, let's just say, Gravure, for example, right? And, and, he, and, and they do a lot of that. They've taken a lot of high-end work that was previously printed reviewer, and, and with the XPS, they can, they can print it Flexo. Let's move north of the border to um, Mississauga. And um, it was great to, to, to work with Sean McHugh and Ken um, Deerstroff there, uh, just to get some pictures and, and start to talk to them about what they like about it, what they don't like about it, um, how they're using it, what are their plans for the future. So all the SGS facilities are really nice facilities, right? Um, inside and out, and Mississauga is no exception there. They do have a really nice plate room. Um, this is a picture of our Crystal XPS, um, Crystal CDI on the right, and our XPS on the left. So they installed it. They did some time studies, some ergonomic studies, uh, moving plates from the warehouse into the CDI and into the XPS, and then from there, into um, plate processors and, and found out they could process more plates if they turned it around. So I have the operator side against the wall here. And um, I'll just show you a, um, a quote from uh, the director of the operations there, Ken uh, Deerstroff. XPS plates perform better on press than any plates we've ever made. They improve the flexographic printing process. And you know, what are we all here to do? Uh, everybody who's attending these two days of the, the ESCO DuPont Summit, we're all trying to improve flexographic printing. And if we can do that in a sustainable way, then um, we might even have a world that our children and grandchildren can grow up in. And, um, you know, packaging's not going to go away, as I think it was uh, Lou who uh, mentioned that, or might have been um, planning. Uh, we need to package our foods, um, but we need to do it in a more sustainable way. So anything we can do to promote Flexo, we should. Let me just put some perspective on this whole thing, because you know the reason I picked SGS. Well, they're just a great company, of course, but um, it's also because they have multiple systems. Now, why do they have multiple systems, right? Um, let me let me let me talk about why they have it, and I'll I'll just read Chuck's um, Chuck's quote: "The greatest benefit of all may be the ability to produce identical plates at different locations." And I know we've all said for years, yes, if you get your main exposure test and your back exposure test right, and you do everything right, you can make plates that are the same at different locations. Everyone here knows that that's to some degree true and to some degree untrue. And it is truer than ever before uh, with XPS exposure technology. So SGS allowed us to show some of the things they do, and I'm gonna share them with you. Um, what they like to do is they like to do their first two steps kind of right out of the ESCO uh, crystal screening print control wizard cookbook. So they start by running a pixel boost step test and they run a print control wizard chart. And then, you know, one of the things that they are masters at is print quality management. So they have their own seven color charts. The neat thing about their seven color chart is they get profiles out of that chart and curves out of that chart. So if you're interested in expanded gamut, you're definitely gonna wanna talk to SGS. You're also gonna wanna talk to ESCO. Um, we bring very similar technologies to the market. We actually promote each other. We do not compete with each other on that. Um, so let's take a look at some of the things on the Pixel Boost step test that they allowed me to share here. And the first one is um, just a huge difference between a normal solid screen and a crystal screen, right? Um, that's the exact same plate, plate, same exposure unit, same tape, same analog, same everything, just a different surface pattern. Let's go up and look at what it does to type, right? So there's text without a surface pattern. And I know this is small text. This is like six, five and four point type or something like that um, with serifs. And I know some people have guidelines not to use that smaller type for serif. 
uh, but it still shows what the technology can do. And I know some of you are saying, hey, we, we've got to print that stuff every day, right? So this is, this is a reality for you. Let's go down and take a look at the, um, the reverses. Big difference in reverse quality. Why? Because there's a big difference in solid quality. What I don't show here, because maybe this wasn't a long enough run, is you get less fill in when you have uh, a crystal screen pattern in your solid, right? Because the ink has somewhere to go. Now, this is a short run, and I don't see fill in on the top, but I sure do see some model there. And then let's take a look at the, um, uh, the dot shape here. So, yeah, you could argue, if you could print a perfect, consistent donut dot through the course of a press run, you could argue that the screen on the left is as good as the screen on the right. But what we know is that you cannot. Donut uh, sizes vary, and when the, vary when the size of the donut varies, your color varies, right? So you want a nice, consistent dot, really, uh, just to give you nice, consistent printing. So SGS will start with a pixel boost step test. Then they'll print a print control wizard chart. And um, I'll show you just some, some stuff on that chart. Um, here you see um, on, on a circular vignette, you can see huge differences between the normal screen and the, um, um, and the crystal screen, right? So both of these are kind of, um, this is, this is uh, with a whole lot of ink on this one sample that I took this from. You can see uh, banding everywhere, but much, much less. I think I have this backward, actually. The crystal screen should be at the top. I got to change this slide. <laughs> the, the one at the top with less banding is the crystal screen. So now let's take a look at some highlights here. So this particular account went with a 22 pixel dot and a min dot of an 0.8. This is a 22 pixel fade in zero. And what they did was they looked at this and they said, okay, I know I can go, I know the smaller I go in spot size, if I go all the way to C9, I'm going to have a more stable, I'm going to have a smoother dot. But really I want stability because I have press runs that are a million impressions or even higher. Really I want stability. So I want to use the largest spot that doesn't look grainy. And they had already said, we know once we get up around 22 or 25 with a bank light, it looks grainy. But at 22 or 25 with an XPS, it doesn't look grainy. It's a smaller dot on your plate and it prints more stable. So they opted for a, um, a C22 dot to get the best possible quality. Now what you can do with the, the PCW chart, the print control wizard chart, you can measure the tone scale and you can choose what you want to aim at. So here, where they're aiming at a 50 is a 72. The actual press is printing a 50 to about 80. So we're going to use a cutback curve of about 10%. Pressing E40 is going to use a cutback of about 10%. So given a cutback curve, um, they're going to go to the third step. And by the way, everybody who works with SGS might have a slightly different workflow. They're into process management, right? Print quality management. So for this particular printer, who was an expanded gamut printer, step number three was to print this chart. So with the screening parameters, that we got from the, um, the step test and the print control wizard chart, they imaged this chart, printed that on their customer's presses. And from that, they get their curves and they get their profiles. And then they adjust the profile mathematically um, for the fact that their next press run production may use different curves. So uh, SGS, I think, is just a great uh, study of employing new technology, uh, you know, really staying ahead of the technology curve uh, to meet the needs of, of brands and, and, um, and converters as well. So I hope we covered for everybody um, LED plate exposure as um, in, in a way that meets all of your expectations. You know, the world is definitely moving from bank light to LED. Corey, I love the off the cuff conversations when you were telling me about, you know, you have to go in and make plates and you just love it when the plate request says uh, uh, XPS. Yes. Um, I, it, I don't have to move my plate around. It's all in one place and it's for the back exposure and the main exposure. So there's a lot less plate handling. Yeah, I, I love it when you say that. Um, and, um, you know, as alluded to in the last one, the world's in, in the midst of a lot of changes here, right? Um, 
And lighting is, is one of those changes. And it's something that all of us that deal with the Flexo Plate Room uh, work with every day, right? And this change is being lit by the technology that we've talked about in the seminar. So we invite you to uh, be a part of uh, the revolution. You know, you can improve your sustainability, your bottom line, and your print quality and your print consistency at the same time by adopting this. So with that, <laughs> um, I think I might owe Julian a beer and a dinner. He's going to yeah. be pretty drunk by the time. We're, we're, we're <laughs> seven minutes over. Seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's um, 314. So yeah, officially, um, you pass your time. Um, don't blame Corey for this, right? Um, I did not blame Corey. And we have a lot of questions. We have a tons of questions here. Um, I'm going to, we are, you are going to try your best to answer in the next 15 minutes. And then, of course, uh, whatever we don't answer, I will try to forward those questions to you. Mm -hmm. So you can direct, them, uh, direct answer those ones. So Corey, uh, first question is for you. One of the benefits of LED is uh, reduce heat. And why is this a benefit? Um, the heat is also involves how much UVA output that it comes out of the lamp. So with the different amount of heat, you could actually be having different amount of UVA output. It also can create just a different atmosphere. There affects the environment. Um, it's really just really affects a lot of variability for plates as well with the UVA output. Excellent. Is that, uh, do you want to add something else to that, Mark, or? Um, I could, but hey, Julian, you also could. You are one of the, you know, the most about Flexo, just about anybody I know. Um, but is the moderator not supposed to add? I think you can add, right? <laughs> we'll see. I let well, you answer first. Well, I'll, 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 I'll add something. something wrong. <laughs> um, ex if you think about it, the sensitivity of a plate, of well, any chemical reaction, no matter what it is in the world we live in, um, heat is a major factor of any chemical reaction, right? The warmer something is, the faster the reaction. And the polymerization of a photopolymer plate is no different. The, the, um, the hotter that plate is, the faster you're going to turn monomer into polymer when, when light hits it. So there's been all kinds of efforts to try to make uniform heat, right? If some people say, well, if the heat's the same everywhere, you can get a nice uniform plate. It's really, really, really hard to make a plate exposure unit that has uniform heat everywhere, right? And I know people have tried, and some with some success, to put cooling systems in the beds of um, uh, plates, right? In the beds of in the beds of um, um, bank light exposure units, with some success, right? Um, but none of it is good as just not having heat to begin with, right? Yeah, I think that it's because of um, uh, what you guys say about consistency. And um, so when you when you start warming up your lamps, it's basically to bring up to the to the uh, temperature that you can hold over the exposure time that you need. Otherwise, I mean, even if it's colder at the beginning, and that might be also good, uh, you will end up with variation because the, the lamps are going to increase the heat. So in this case, I guess that the that will benefit um, the polymerization, as you said. All right. So uh, next question is, uh, Mark, you show very sh small dots being held by uh, via LED exposure. Can you hold just a small of a dot with bank light if you increase the exposure? No way. No, I'm kidding. You can actually hold almost any dot uh, you want on an LED or a bank, right? But there's two parts to the question, right? If you give the bank light plate enough exposure to hold these really, really small knots, you're damaging other areas of the plate. We used to say that when you overexpose the plate, reverses would fill in, but you can actually take fine lines and, and, and you know, take fine lines and make them have bulges in them and things like that. So when we certify our plates, we find an exposure that holds the smallest dot that it can hold without damaging the rest of the plate. And then when we measure that plate, uh, we every plate we certify, we measure against the standard, which is that same plate material made in a bank light. Um, we have data that I'm not allowed to share um, uh, that shows that the actual dot on the LED plate is smaller. So if you if you take a C22 dot, 
which is about 20 microns in size, expose it on a bank and expose it on an LED, and you measure the final plate, it will be smaller on the LED. Right. Corey, do you want um, uh, to Mark's um, answer? No, that was a good answer. Thank you. Excellent. I think that you answered this one before, Corey, but just it's, uh, I have the question here. So uh, how do you dis uh, dispose mercury tubes and how do you, do you dispose uh, LED lights? Well, the LED lights are very simple to get rid of or dispose. You can just do that in your normal garbage or landfill. But with mercury filled lamps, you really have to find someone that can take those plates or um, tubes away and get rid of them um, safely because there's mercury inside those lamps. I've been to some locations where they have their attics filled with tubes because they can't find someone to take it. Um, right. You just have to find a place to um, take them. Yeah. Another question for you is, what is the total exposure time on EFX on the Crystal XPS unit? Ooh, I don't know if I know that access time right now. I think it's about 13 minutes. I think you're really close. The only reason I know is because I was just at Hammer Packaging, yeah, yeah. who does 45. The 45,000 EFX is 12 minutes on the XPS. Yeah. On their 4835 XPS, it'd be a little bit longer on a 5080. Right. And so again, that depends on the size of the plate, because if you're doing it on a, um, because the head moves all the way across the whole length of the plate. So it'll be different access time if it's on a 5080 versus a 4835 versus the new 4260 that will come out. Because it's how many passes that um, LED has to travel back and forth across that plate. Yeah. And then the length of the plate will affect that as well. That's right. So it would be different from um, the 4835 compared to the 5080, is that what you're saying, right? Yes, yes. And, um, and, uh, and that is something that you cannot do with a conventional backlight because it doesn't matter the size of the plate, you need to um, close the clamp or the, put, put the plate in the exposure unit and expose the plate for, for the time it is. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, it should be... Um, Maybe to do a comparison there in those cases. Um, okay, so another question here, Mark. Um, you show how the cell type surface pattern uh, yields much, much better quality on film. Uh, does it do the same for paper? Yeah, I could comment, and you could comment, and Corey could comment, really. Um, you know, I've had people run a, run a crystal screening test on paper, and they come back and they say, it didn't work. And um, and I and I'm trying to well, what do you mean it didn't work? I'm like, did you have trouble printing a solid or a nice solid dot? They're like, oh no no no, we could print a perfect solid or a perfect solid dot, uh, you know, before. And I'm like, well, what are you printing on? They're like, a paper, right? So if you know crystal screening, the cell patterns in crystal screening are will only help you if you have problems printing nice uniform dots or nice uniform solids or nice uniform type, right? If you don't have trouble with that then um, you don't need it as a solution. And we've done, we've made some things to improve our highlights with crystal screening. It, that's a bit more technical than we wanted to go. And so we have new crystal screens that don't even have cell patterns. And um, so I have to change that, what I've told everybody. because I said, hey, a crystal screen always has a cell pattern. Well, the new ones don't, but they have a better highlight pattern in, in the highlight. And I'd say for, you know, I'm, I'll oversimplify. I'll make a very simplified statement. for paper or absorbent substrates, you probably don't need a surface pattern. You can test it, there's no harm in testing it. Um, and I would say for most um, plastics and most you know, non-porous substrates the, in which the ink has nowhere to go, uh, a surface pattern can help a lot, as I showed in the SGS samples. Corey, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, sure. The other thing to remember with paper, the ink absorbs into the paper with the film, it spreads and it doesn't have anywhere to go. So that's what causes a lot of the um, pinholing and so forth because the ink's just flowing around where with paper it goes right into the absorbs, the surface pattern. 
What do you say, yeah. Julian? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, I think that you can tie it to the next question, which is related to the pin control wizard. Um, does the pin control wizard offer a different, it's any different when you do it for film or for paper? How you select what printing uh, methodology you're going to be using? Yeah, so the first step of the print control wizard, and remember, version 18 was all single color. Um, version 20 and beyond is going to be four color and even seven color. Um, and um, the um, the very first step, though, no matter what, is to run a step test. So I showed the Pixel Boost step test, and it has different surface patterns on it. So I think if I were doing paper, I'd probably still – I want to hear your opinion, Julian, but I think if I were doing paper, I would probably still start with that. But I wouldn't expect the surface pattern to be the winner in quotes. But um, it'd be it'd be interesting testing. So um, if, if you do that on film, you then you pick a surface pattern. Then the next step target, whether it's a single color or the four color or higher, uh, will have that surface pattern in the solids of well and in the dots throughout the um, the test target. Yeah. What I would say is that. Um, it also depends not only on the substrate, but the ink system that you're using. Because um, I've seen differences between UV ink and uh, water-based inks in the case of paper. So I, I will start with both. And uh, I, I think that it actually doesn't hurt uh, to have it on the test, right? I agree totally um, with the Pixel Plus step test. When I think of um, paper printers, I usually think water-based or UV ink, and UV ink typically doesn't need any type of a surface pattern. Water-based ink, like you said, may need that, and it's all about the ink system. I mean, solvent ink flows differently than both water-based and UV, so it's really the ink system that has a lot to do, and the substrate naturally has to do with when you need these different surface technologies. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question here, um, and we are running out of time. What is the difference between the cells in a crystal screen and the cells in an HD Flexo screen? Um, I have, let me, let me, if I was really good at my job, I could get to a um, picture of this. Um, let me, um, okay, so, um, what you see there, you know, Julian. When I show pictures to people, it's I know what the picture is. I don't. I don't know how many people out there can understand what the pixel picture is, but those are dots that you see there with cells inside the dots. Um, so this the crystal screen, an HD flexo screen, always had a protection ring around the dot, and it it, it either had a fade parameter, which means the dot went from 100 and let's say faded at 65 percent which means below 65 was completely solid, or it had a protection ring, two pixels or four pixels of a protection ring. And with that, um, with, with the crystal screening, the dots um, go all the way to the edge that you see there. Um, I have some other uh, slides on that too, if I can find them, um, but I don't think I'm gonna find them up now, right? Um, the, the I think that that's a, that's a good example. I will, I will add only that um, for us, from the ESCO point of view, crystal screen is, is the evolution of HG Flexo. And the reason why we were able to evolve to this type of screening is now because we have control on the exposure, that before we didn't have that much control on that because even if you go to a customer who has a brand new exposure frame, um, on time, that frame is going to output differently because it, the tubes are going to um, uh, to get used, the, there's going to be variation. Maybe the operator doesn't remember to warm up uh, the lamps, or maybe, as Corey uh, explained before, uh, they expose couple of um, back expose couple of plates before imaging them. So that was something that didn't allow to the use of the, what we call now the crystal screens. Yeah, um, I did manage to find that slide. It was a hidden slide. To not get into too much technical detail, but um, what you see on your left is a solid dot. What you see in the center is a an HD flexo with a WSI pattern in the middle. Now, what's hard to imagine in your in your mind is those teeny little pixels are going to turn into great big cells when you image a plate. But we always had a protection ring there. 
And earlier I alluded to, why do we get donut dots? We get donut dots because there's a hydraulic vacuum being pulled. So you can think of ink sitting on a solid dot, making contact you know, with, with the substrate, the, the plastic, and when it pulls away, you, feel, you hear the sucking sound, right? And, and that's pulling the ink from the center of the dot. Well, when you surround a dot with protection rings, it's, it still will have the suction. You haven't eliminated the suction. You only eliminate the suction when you, when you have let, the, let the cells go all the way to the edge of the dot. And we've had many customers, and Hammer is one of them. I, you know, they were a case study, so I'm, I think I'm allowed to, to, to show what they've allowed us to show. Um, Hammer is one of them where, the, with the protection rings, it still they still had the problem with the dots. It wasn't until they went to the crystal screen with no protection uh, that they got the dot quality that they wanted. And um, these are real images. We did not doctor anything here. And you can see the protection ring um, with the HD Flexo screen still had the donut dot, right? To get rid of the whole donut, you needed to go uh, to the crystal. Perfect. Um, okay, I'm going to send out the last question for the day and the session. Um, other than Cyril EFX, what other thermal plates does DuPont recommend for the label segment, Corey? Well, the EFX plate is one, right? Then we also have the DFM and the DFR. It really depends on the durometer or plate. I mean, DFM is a softer plate. So if you have a substrate that's a paper stock or a craft or, you know, something that's porous, the DFM plate is a softer plate. So it will mold, let's say, to those surfaces. A DFR is a very common plate that's used in the flexo world, and that's probably was before the EFX the most commonly used um, thermal plate. But primarily, these are the three plates. We're getting ready, you know, we continue to improve and continue to develop plates. So we could be having some more thermal plates in the near future as well. Excellent. Well, I'm not going to ask you more to um, comment on that. <laughs> I think that Corey uh, voices more than the, um, the right answer. So uh, with that being said, thank you both of you. I don't want if you I don't know if you want to make a final statement before we close the session of the day. I kind of have a final statement. Um, Corey, do you have one? No, you can go ahead. Sustainability <laughs> is probably the most important thing to me and fast thermal will give you that sustainability. And yes, there are some more thermal plates. So I, mean, I think that's important. Um. So I wanted to, I agree with you there, by the way, I thought the, the first, the, the town hall that preceded this was outstanding. Great participants you got there, Pallavi, Orlando, Lou, and Dan. But at the very end, Pallavi made a statement that we really have a, um, a shortage of skilled workers in the flexo industry. And I think we need to address that. That's probably right after sustainability that needs to, to be addressed. And um, very specifically, like, if you look at the at the college level, we have really good schools uh, that are um, graduating people who understand flexography. You know, we work with Clemson all the time, and and we work with Cal Poly as well. I was on a call the other day with Cal Poly, and RIT, whose graphics program has had almost gone away, is is revamping it. It's being put in the College of Engineering Technology. So, you know, my challenge: the, the kids that are coming out of Clemson today are smarter than me. Right, so my challenge is to not let my boss realize that they're smarter than me, right? And that's getting to be more and more of a challenge every day. And the Cal Poly kids are the same, and, and I'm sure it's gonna be the same with, with the other schools. Where we really have an issue is we need like really good high schools or technical schools or community colleges uh, that can train pressmen, that can train skilled pressmen. Um, Julian and I um, know that when, when we print at Clemson, uh, and we had Caroline and um, before that Brad, we hit, we would print perfect expanded gamut, you know, with the Delta E of the spot colors down around one Delta E. And um, there's, you know, there's no way to um, overly stress the need for employees. But I, I think at the college level, that's pretty much solved. The only thing I could do in asking everyone who's attending here, if you know a, a, somebody who's interested in a career in flexography or in graphics and high end, they better like IT, number one, right? And they better really enjoy kind of art and graphics and design and things like that. And have them look at uh, Clemson or, or Cal Poly or RIT or a range of other schools that have that. Um, 
Uh, and you, you get a degree that uh, will give you the employment opportunities, really almost of getting an engineering degree, you know, somewhat up in, in that level. Um, but what, what, we, what we're really missing is um, the, the high school and the community college level. So there's, there's where we need to focus some effort. Excellent. Yeah, I agree with both of you. And um, oh, Ryerson, Julian, I gotta say yeah, Ryerson. I forgot to, to say Ryerson. They, <laughs> same, same goes there. They have great graduates yeah. uh, who are also smarter than me, and I'm trying not to let my boss know that. So, um, well, I mean, final statement. I'm going to uh, close the session for the day. I really appreciate everyone who was able to hang up uh, all the time with us. And uh, if you have questions, please send them to us. And um, stay safe and keep social distancing. <laughs> Until next time, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.